All right. The hour has come. Welcome everyone to the Minnesota Senate Transportation Committee meeting of Friday, April 19th, 2024. The time is 1.30. Uh, we are in room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building. In accordance with the rules of the Senate, the following members will be participating remotely in today's hearing. Uh, Senator Morrison from Deep Haven, Minnesota. Senator Herr from Kansas City, Kansas. Senator Coleman from uh, Naples, Florida. Um, and I know we will have members uh, moving in and out of uh, present and remote status uh, throughout the hearing. Um, so we'll make note of those when that occurs. Um, a quorum is present. And uh, members uh, and to the audience, we have, uh, we're finishing up the work that we started earlier this week on Senate File 5284, the Transportation Supplemental Finance Omnibus Bill. Um, I have good news. Um, there are no amendments. It's <laughs> incredible. They, they love the bill as presented. No. <laughs> I just stole that joke from Senator Jasinski. He just made that joke a few minutes ago. Um, so yeah, thank you for everyone's patience. That's why we are um, detained a little bit working through the issues and um, and generating uh, new ideas and, and uh, amendments and things like that. So I appreciate everyone's forbearance, everyone's patience. Um, so what we are going to do is um, start off with a technical amendment, um, uh, which I will have uh, Senator Bolden offer. And um, I, don't, I don't know what the number of it is. It's the A69, um, so Senator Bolden offers the A69, and um, Ms. Boyd will acquaint us with the A69, and then also point out some changes that it implies for the spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, oh, I before, before, just um, uh, for members, um, because everyone is kind of all in different places, uh, we're, we're going to default to roll calls. It's not... Uh, you know, we often do roll calls as an as a as a as a aggressive measure, as it were, or or you know something that's uh, not necessarily. But but it's, we're just going to do it as a as a good practice, unless I hear an objection to that. Uh, we're going to try to default to roll calls, um, except when there may be a good reason not to do a roll call. I'll I'll try to take your lead on that, Senator Drzinski. Um But uh, because we have people in so many different places and moving around so much and. Uh, when there's a, a voice vote and there, a division is called, people who are remote can't be counted in that division as the rules stand now. So we just want to default to roll calls if that's okay. okay. Senator Jasinski. Mr. Chair, just one question. I, and I want to first of all thank staff. We have many amendments here. So you guys have done a great job bringing these amendments, uh, to putting them together so that we can offer them. But uh, we've worked on a couple with you. Uh, if they are friendly, I, I, again, we have a long meeting today. I will announce if I think they're friendly, and if I think we go without the roll call, it'll speed up the meeting. Is that okay with you? Or um, Yes, I think so. I think that would probably be fine. Um, uh, of course, my members don't always follow me on everything. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, I'm not that kind of chair, and they all know that they're free to, to vote their conscience. So. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll try to stay in touch with, with my members um, uh, as, as uh, I might, there might be some daylight between myself and them on a okay. given issue. All right, thank, thank you. you. So, uh, Ms. Boyd, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Looking at the A69, um, I'm not going to walk through every line of it. Most of it is purely technical, correcting citations, uh, correcting grammar, putting in better choices of words. Um, so I suppose you'll have to trust staff on that, but if there are specific questions, I can certainly answer them. I'm just going to point out a couple of things um, that maybe rise to a little bit higher level, uh, starting on lines 1.6 through 1.11. Um, this is an appropriation for a provision that's already in the A3. Um, this is an appropriation that should have gone along with that of 105000 um, starting in fiscal year 25 and each year thereafter from the Trunk Highway Fund. Um, for MnDOT staff time to coordinate with the Public Utilities Commission, and this has to do with the high voltage transmission lines language. Um, down further on the first page, starting on 123, uh, is an appropriation to the Department of Commerce. This is an ongoing appropriation of 46,000 from the general fund, and this also has to do with the high voltage transmission line provision. 
Um, this is um, uh, environmental review that's going to be required by Department of Commerce staff. Um, this um, appropriation is covered by assessments that the Department of Commerce can institute, so that will be offset by um, automatic statutory revenue in the Department of Commerce. On line 1.28, um, there's a change. This is a correction to the um, uh, reduction amount to the previous year's appropriation for IIJA um, discretionary grant funds from the general fund. Um, it was 10.5 million in the A3 and it should have been 14.5 um, to comply with the $2 million target and general fund that the transportation budget has. And then on page two, um, there's an addition that was left out of the A3 um, appropriations. This is related to um, the provisions um, shifting responsibility for LRT construction from the Met Council to the Department of Transportation. Um, this is this was uh, originally adopted to the original bill, Senate File 1625. It's broad language just directing uh, the Met Council and the department to work with management and budget to identify and sort of coordinate um, shifts of appropriations for this purpose between the agencies um, and then report to the legislature. Uh, on line, uh, lines 212 through 214, this is a shift of the appropriation um, uh, for uh, local government for their roadway system. Um, um, I, I can't remember what section it is, but there was an appropriation, I believe, for the, it, it becomes effective for the Minneapolis Parks and Rec Board um, for, it was for two million from the general fund um, in 25 and two million in fiscal year 26. Um, we're shifting that back to four million just in 25, making it available through the next biennium. So there's no change to the bottom line for that. It just shifts it per year. And then I believe my last one is uh, a correction on lines 217 through 219. That was the appropriation to the city of Shorewood to create a transportation management organization. And that should have said this is a one-time appropriation. And it was, didn't reflect that in the A3. And um, Mr. Chair, I can briefly go through, there's an updated spreadsheet available and I can briefly go through, although I've covered most of that in the technical. Um, the spreadsheet is uh, for today, April 19th. Um, it includes the governor's recommendations as compared to the A3 um, and the technical amendment that I just walked through is worked into the spreadsheet. So uh, briefly on lines eight through 11, these are, um, uh, statutory uh, appropriations from the state rail safety inspection account in the special revenue fund and these are related to four different provisions of the bill having to do with uh, with uh, rail policy the yardmaster hours of service uh, provisions the mandated maximum train length provisions wayside detector systems and uh, increasing insurance coverage for motor carriers for rails for rail employees um, these appropriations are statutory and made out of that account uh, and can be an, are offset by revenue assessed to railroads. So that is offset by revenue later in the spreadsheet. Uh, on line 19, there is uh, that 105,000 from the trunk highway fund that I noted in the technical for staff time at MnDOT related to high voltage transmission lines. Uh, line 33 is Oh, the shifting of the two million back into 25 for the uh, MPRB um, appropriations. So it's four million and 25 now, rather than two million and 25 and two million and 26. And uh, on page three of the spreadsheet, on lines 103 through 106, that's the pickup of the revenue uh, for um, the rail safety pieces to the rail safety account. Line 111 is a fiscal, uh, reflects a fiscal note that was just um, completed. This provision is already in the A3, but we uh, just received the revenue information. This is related to online driver's license renewal. So this will be increased revenue to the DVS account to the Department of Public Safety. You'll see that's a, about 1 million in fiscal year 25 and 1.47 million each year thereafter. Uh, and on line 114, this is the revenue piece for the Department of Commerce Environmental Review that would offset the general fund appropriation higher up in the spreadsheet. And then on line 133, you'll see that we're uh, correctly reflecting in the biennial column there, the two million target um, that was given to the Transportation Committee for the general fund. Thank you, uh, Ms. Boyd. Questions, members? <clears throat> All right. I I think we can probably go with a voice vote on this. All right. 
All in favor of the A69, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Um, so next up, um, we don't. Okay, so next up, uh, we will go to uh, testimony. Um, and so um, everyone may have their printed agenda. We'll just go in the order uh, that we have folks listed here. Um, and we're looking for about three minutes for testimony, less if you can. Um, and with that, we'll start off with uh, Hennepin County Commissioner Marion Green. I'll, I'll announce um, the next three people so we can kind of move through quickly. So the first three we have are uh, Marion Green, Hennepin County Commissioner, uh, Steve Huser from the City of Minneapolis, and Ethan Foley from the City of Minneapolis. Good Welcome afternoon. to the committee. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Marion Green. I am a Hennepin County Commissioner for District 3 and the Chair of our Regional Rail Authority. Hennepin County plays a significant role in funding the region's high capacity transit system, providing capital funding for our light rail and highway bus rapid transit projects to better connect Minnesotans, supporting a thriving economy, and together to meet our climate action goals. Last session, you all passed a historic transportation bill to make transformational improvements and deliver a robust network of fast, frequent, reliable service. This bill builds on that work to help deliver transit projects the right way. First, when it comes to large-scale infrastructure projects like the Blue Line extension, uh, we must work to ensure that project benefits the residents and businesses currently in these communities. The Blue Line Extension Light Rail Transit Project will connect Brooklyn Park through Crystal, Robbinsdale, and North Minneapolis, serving racially diverse transit-dependent communities that have felt the lasting impacts of historical redlining and disinvestment. Since the project's inception, community has voiced excitement for the project and what it will mean for residents. The community knows that this level of service for these communities is overdue, and they are ready to receive it. Concurrently, community has also consistently expressed concerns that the, about the risks for residential, economic, and cultural displacement impacts. Hennepin County recognizes the urgency neighbors feel for strong anti-displacement measures, and we have been working with local, metro, and federal partners to advance policies and secure funding. In fact, I was in Washington, D.C. 10 days ago, and there was enthusiasm from the White House and the FTA for your work and innovation on this, so thank you. As the geographies directly served by the line see economic benefits accrue, we look forward to working with this committee to make sure corridor residents and businesses share in the project benefits by investing in community-driven anti-displacement strategies. Second, this bill builds on that work to ensure that we deliver safe and efficient transit projects. It will require arterial bus rapid transit projects to include full ADA improvements at station locations and transit-specific infrastructure to improve the speed and reliability and reach of the service. Hennepin County and fellow local governments have been close partners in the implementation of these projects, and we will continue to invest millions in these corridors to improve safety and maintain the roadways. I want to thank you for making sure that these projects are fully scoped. Full project scoping will mean shared understanding upfront on what a project will include and what it will cost. That will serve all jurisdictions, including the legislature, better than the current more piecemeal approach. Thank you again for your work and opportunity to testify. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, so we have Steve Huser, Ethan Foley, and then Pat Benner. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Steve Huser. I'm a government relations representative for the city of Minneapolis. Um, Ethan Foley is here in the room as well to speak to uh, some provisions in the bill if, if necessary. Um, but Mr. Chair, I wanna thank you and members of the committee for the work you've done on this bill and the work you've done this session. Uh, we appreciate the inclusion of our traffic safety camera legislation in this bill. It's our strong belief that this, is, this now pilot program will show the safety benefits of this technology uh, I also want to thank uh, Senator Muhammad and Senator Umu Verbaten for their work on that legislation as well. Uh, thank you for including the pedestrian mall authority expansion, also in Article 2. This would allow cities 
uh, to have more meaningful conversations on the use of their right of way. And I also want to thank Senator Muhammad for her authorship on that provision. Uh, the city of Minneapolis is very supportive of the inclusion of the bus rapid transit bus rapid transit project scoping provision. Um, it's our be strong belief that this provision will help uh, to create much better and full projects going forward. The city also supports the inclusion of the Lights On program. Uh, the city of Minneapolis uh, is a participant in that program. And then finally, um, I want to thank uh, the committee for including the Blue Line Extension Anti-Displacement Program. Um, as Commissioner Green stated, uh, we believe this will be an important work that will ensure that the benefits of this project will reach everyone in our communities. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Huser. So Pat Benner, uh, Sherry Munyon, and then Trevor Russell. Uh, Mr. Chair, I actually was going to speak specifically to the A8 amendment, so I don't know if you are taking testimony on amendments later or doing it now. Um, yeah, why don't, we, uh, why don't we just bring you up at the A8, because um, that's a new idea, and right. members will be curious to know what that's about. Um, Ms. Munyon. Welcome. Senator Dibble, members, I'm Sherry Munyon, representing the Minnesota Public of Transportation Association. I want to thank Senator McEwen for taking the time to meet with me on the zero emission bill. And we thank you for exempting our small rural transit systems. We still do have some concerns and also suggest that the timeline for purchasing buses be extended till 2035 while manufacturers are still catching up on filling existing orders. Some of those orders are still a couple years behind in delivery, and the state has gone from 10 manufacturers to three in the United States. We know weather and distance are factors challenging the viability of electric buses as a replacement for diesel buses, and there will not be a one-for-one -one bus replacement to maintain the same level of service. In addition, the cost increase is significant. We do hope passage of this policy bill will result in the 2025 budget bill providing significant resources for infrastructure as well as the increased cost of bus orders. Without funding for bus purchases, we fear that there will be reduced uh, number of buses that can be purchased by our systems. If we have a speedy transition to zero emission buses, that results in less people being able to take the bus due to fewer buses, and we increase the number of solo car drivers, what have we gained? We again suggest the plan should measure the environmental benefits and a cost comparison of simply putting more buses on the streets to increase ridership and improve the environment. But we do look forward to continued discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Munyon. Uh, so we have Trevor Russell and Jeremy Martin, uh, and then uh, Graham Berg Moberg. And Mr. Oh. Chairman, I'm also signed up to speak on one other provision. Oh, uh, Again, uh, Mr. Chairman, members, my name is Sherry Munyon, the former representative of Citizens for Work Zone Safety, here speaking in memory of my friend Lisa Reduns, who spent over a decade dedicated to helping save lives, focusing on the reduction of speeding in highway work zones. Tragedy struck in 2011 when two electrical contractor friends of hers, Craig Carlson and Ron Rakowski with Egan Company, were working in a highway right-of-way. They were killed by a car that plowed into them alongside Interstate 35W in Burnsville. Lisa actively started lobbying for change and simultaneously trying to provide emotional support for their wives and their children during that difficult time. Lisa collaborated with the Association of General Contractors to help pass a higher speeding fine in work zones. Unfortunately, that was not enough to prevent other workers from losing their lives. This refueled her desire to protect workers, and she created the Citizens for Work Zone Safety with a goal of protecting those who worked and traveled in highway work zones through speed reduction and the use of cameras. After over 11 years of advocacy, Lisa passed away, and without her leadership, the coalition disbanded. 
However, numerous safety advocates and partners have continued to collaborate on efforts to achieve the goals. I want to thank Reed Lytle with Safety Signs for his volunteer efforts all of these years, as well as the Transportation Alliance Asphalt Pavers Safety Council, NECA, the Association of General Contractors, and many others, including the families of Craig and Ron. Thank you also to the City of Minneapolis for today's efforts and also MnDOT and DPS for their support. This week marks the anniversary of Lisa's death and Work Zone Safety Awareness Week. There could not be a better way to honor her advocacy than the inclusion of this pilot project. It's also very important that we remember the 35 MnDOT workers and the 16 contractors who have lost their lives in highway work zones while serving the public. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Munyon. So we have Trevor Russell, Jeremy Martin is uh, going to join us remotely. I suspect they're going to be speaking on a similar topic, or if not the exact same topic. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Russell. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members, uh, for the record, my name is Trevor Russell. I'm the Water Program Director with Friends of the Mississippi River. And on behalf of FMR, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak on this bill. Earlier this session, the committee heard Senate File 2584, which would create a clean transportation standard that reduces the carbon intensity of Minnesota's transportation fuels. During that hearing, stakeholders raised some important questions about how a CTS would work and what the implications might be for our environment and transportation economy. Uh, the bill before you uh, assigns the University of Minnesota's Center for Transportation Studies to investigate those questions further and report back to the legislature. Um, that is a provision that we strongly support. Uh, we feel it'll provide us all with truly objective analysis from a trusted third party source with expertise in transportation policy. And we appreciate the chair for bringing his initiative forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Russell. Mr. Martin, if you're able to join us remotely. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can see you too. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Union of Concerned Scientists in support of the, the proposal uh, just mentioned to uh, for a study of the Clean Transportation Standard by the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota in Section 132 of the A3 Amendment to the Senate Transportation Appropriations Bill. Uh, in, in March, I was pleased to speak in support of the Senator Dibble's Clean Transportation Standard Bill and was disappointed it didn't move forward in the session. Uh, but the discussions revealed a broad range of views, not just on the merits, but on some of the key facts about the proposal. So I think it's really uh, valuable uh, to support an impartial analysis from trusted uh, Minnesota experts on the facts to allow a more informed consideration of the proposal or related measures in the future. Uh, the study, as described, will provide a review of similar policies in other jurisdictions, the economic impact of the policy, costs or savings per mile for Minnesota drivers, as well as strategies to implement the policy in a flexible manner that supports Minnesota's climate goals without creating an undue burden on Minnesota drivers. The study will also evaluate the interaction with federal incentives and compare the clean transportation standard uh, with other strategies to support equitable transportation electrification and reduce the carbon intensity of, trans of, of biofuels and other fuels consistent with the state's climate action framework. Gathering reliable information to inform important policy decisions is an important part of the policymaking process. So I am very happy to see this provision in here and I urge you to support the study. Thanks very much. Thank you. So I have Graham Berg Moberg, uh, then I have Margaret Donahoe, and then Phil Stahlberger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Of thank the you. Welcome. Hey, uh, my name is Graham Berg Moberg, and I'm with the Minnesota Association of Townships. Uh, we're speaking in support of the proposed modifications to Minnesota Statute 162.081, uh, Subdivision 4. That is uh, the allowing of funding to be used for debt service on bonding. Um, we appreciate the additional flexibility uh, allowed by this proposal, uh, and it's one tool and toolkit for townships to, to take on the maintenance obligations uh, that are, are necessary. Uh, nevertheless, we do remain concerned about the state of investment in township roads generally. Uh, just Ballpark bigger picture, roughly 16% of Minnesotans, that is a little bit less than a million people, live in townships. That 16% maintains roughly 40% of Minnesota's road network, mostly through property taxes. Uh, for context, that 40% is the fourth largest network in the, in, in the US. Uh, while we are traditionally very fiscally efficient, this is a significant burden on us and on our citizens. 
In our view, townships need roughly $100 million per year from the state in order to keep up with that maintenance obligation. Uh, and this burden is high enough that we've recently had a case um, in Cass County, Lena Township, of a township that had to dissolve uh, due to being unable to meet its road maintenance obligations. Uh, the specific trigger was the, the turn back of a county road in, in that case, uh, which the township was simply unable to maintain. Uh, nevertheless, this bill is, is one tool in the, uh, the toolkit. We appreciate the additional flexibility, and we thank you for your consideration uh, and your support of our citizens. Thank you so much. Um, Margaret Donahoe. Welcome to the Thank committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, for the record, I'm Margaret Donahoe, director of the Minnesota Transportation Alliance. So first of all, um, on behalf of our member organizations, I would like to express our deep appreciation for the historic transportation funding bill passed last year that increased dedicated funding for a number of modes and jurisdictions well into the future. The motor vehicle registration tax and MVES revenues are increasing thanks to the legislation passed last year. The fuel tax revenue, however, is now projected to be almost 300 million less from fiscal year 24 through 27 than what had been expected at the end of last session due to a language issue with the indexing provision and a decrease in revenue from the end of the session forecast. With growing demands on the system, inflation spikes, and aging trunk highway bridges, we believe it's important to shore up the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund in the future. To that end, we would suggest adding uh, language from legislation introduced uh, this session by Senator Jasinski to simply speed up the full dedication of the revenue from the sales tax on auto repair parts, a dedication that has enjoyed bipartisan support. Uh, this plan would provide very small increases in the percentage going into the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund over the next three fiscal years, with larger increases after the next biennium. The impact of the percentage increases would be about $3 million over the next three fiscal years, and canceling an additional $3 million in IIJA matching funds would allow for this change. Of the 216 million appropriated for matching federal IIJA funds over the next four years, over a little over 100 million has been awarded in grants so far. Uh, while we also appreciate the 15 million for corridors of commerce in the bill, uh, we would also urge consideration of legislation that would provide 300 million in trunk highway bonds for the corridors of commerce program. Um, according to MnDOT's February transportation forecast, the fund has the capacity for an additional $611 million in trunk highway bonds while staying within the 20% guidance of funds uh, attributable or debt service for the trunk highway fund. Uh, finally, uh, we would like to thank you for your recognition of the need to ensure that trunk highway funds are used for a highway purpose. And uh, we see that in numerous places in the bill and also for including some of the recommendations of the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Working Group in this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Donahoe. Mr. Stahlberger, and then we have uh, Joel Mueller and Nicholas Kadich. Welcome. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. My name is Phil Stahlberger, representing Ryder Academy as well as Aerostitch. Uh, you have in your packet um, a letter from the CEO of Aristich, who is also the founding organizer of Ride to Work, which is a uh, national effort to get more people to ride to work. Um, I'm here today to thank you, um, first, for including uh, Senator Coleman's Senate File 5174 in the supplemental bill. and appreciate it in Article 2. Also wanted to, um, like Senator Jasinski, thank the staff for all their hard work on this bill. There's, and all of the bills, we appreciate all, the, all those efforts. Um, previous testimony from various organizations talk about safety of motorcyclists, couldn't agree more. Um, I do have the utmost respect for law enforcement and in respect to their testimony on Wednesday, um, part of this whole concept of allowing motorcyclists to lane split is for safety purposes as well as to uh, reduce the amount of traffic. Uh, the fact is I can see cars in front of me, I can't see them behind me. And in you know lower 
traffic speeds, I am able to uh, react quicker than someone that is behind me. So uh, I've taken motorcycle safety courses, as many of the riders do. Uh, Jed Duncan, who's the CEO of Rider Academy, couldn't be here today. He's actually in the old Sears parking lot as we speak, teaching uh, 25 motorcyclists how to be uh, safe riders. So lane sharing is, is a worldwide um, natural behavior. Most countries allow this currently. Uh, we allow bicyclists to have other lanes. Uh, as a motorcycle community, and if you haven't heard from your constituents, um, you probably will be, um, both in the business community in terms of um, uh, dealerships, but also club members, that we're not asking for an appropriation for a specific lane. We're just asking for um, a little more space on our existing infrastructure to be safer, reduce congestion, and reduce pollution. Um, eight other states have passed this some form, and uh, we look forward to this um, becoming law in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stahlberger. Uh, so Joel Mueller and Nicholas Kadich. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and then proceed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members of the committee, I'm Joel Mueller with the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, a uh, labor union representing uh, engineers and conductors. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking Chair Dibble uh, for including the rail safety provisions in this bill. I would also like to thank uh, Senator Kupek for authoring those uh, bills. Uh, recently, the class one uh, rail carriers have uh, faced safety challenges. This is supported by the FRA data provided to this committee by the Regional Rail Authority. When you dive into the cross tabs of this information, you will notice that after decades of downward trends in derailments, incidents, injuries, and deaths, they are now on an upward trajectory. This trend has caught the attention of the Federal Railroad Administration prompting that agency to conduct a safety analysis on all the Class One railroads. Because of this alarming trend, we thank you for including the rail safety provisions in sections 89 through 93 of this bill. These initiatives help address several safety shortfalls the industry has experienced that has led to high profile derailments, yet still allowing the rail carriers the flexibility to invest in technology that expands beyond the basic requirements of this bill. I wanna finish by saying that the BLET, BLET members that I represent are proud of the work we do. We want the industry to thrive. It is in everyone's best interest that Minnesota has a robust, efficient, and safe rail network. And the provisions in this bill will help accomplish that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Mr. Kadich, uh, then followed by Amber Backus. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Dibble and committee members. My name is Nick Kadich, and I am the Minnesota Legislative Director for Smart Transportation Division a labor union representing conductors, engineers, and yardmasters. So thank you for including uh, the rail safety sections 89 through 93 in Senate file 5284. They serve the best interests of rail workers, shippers, the public, and even the railroads. The only reason to oppose these standards would be to appease the Wall Street bottom line, certainly not for any reason related to running a good business. States have authority to regulate railroads. This has been proven over and over in our state and we have good laws reflecting this. When the railroads don't want something, they use federal preemption as a blanket argument, even when it doesn't apply. They threaten to sue. They threaten to withhold monies they owe. The phrase getting railroaded has several meanings. None of them are positive. As a railroad conductor myself, speaking with the voice and experience of all the conductors, engineers, and yardmasters I represent, I ask you to trust in us. We're the workers who actually do the job and want to see the railroads succeed and the customers be serviced. Safety isn't a buzzword for us. It's literally life and death. We aren't interested in what Wall Street wants. We're not in this for short-term profit gains. We're here for the wrong, long haul full careers dedicating our lives to this profession. I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, later on today, and thank you for your time. Please support rail safety and rail workers. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kadich. Now for the other perspective. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Backus. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, members, and have a different perspective as you uh, just guessed. My name is Amber Backus with United Strategies here on behalf of the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association, and we are in opposition to the new regulations on freight railroads in sections 89 to 93 that will add cost and disruption to all railroads operating in Minnesota, including Minnesota's regional and short line railroads. There's a narrative that railroads are unsafe and getting less safe, but FRA data does not support this. And to Mr. Mueller's point, derailments could be something like a wheel coming off a train in the yard. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that every derailment is something happening in, 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 while the train is moving on a corridor. But over the last decade in Minnesota, total accidents and incidents have fallen 46%. Equipment caused accidents have fallen 66% and incidents on mainline tracks have dropped 52%. And earlier this month, the FRA released data from a new inspection program focusing on high hazard flammable train routes, which you can find a summary of in your packets. Over the past 12 months, 443 inspections were conducted in Minnesota, the fourth most of any state in the nation, with 157 of those performed by MnDOT's own state rail inspectors. In the course of those reviews, 102 wayside detectors were inspected and 75 operating practice reviews examined dispatch and crew responses to wayside detector notifications. Out of the 443 inspections, five recommended violations, a rate of 1.13%. And when you compare employee injury rates of railroads to other modes of transportation, railroads have the lowest, as you can see in the letter in your packets. And regarding hazardous material incidents, freight railroads numbers are infinitesimal when compared to trucking. Yet the disparate approach between the management, uh, excuse me, the treatment of freight transportation modes in this bill is stark. The delete all funds rest areas to help truck drivers comply with federal hours of service laws and makes investments in highway corridors for truck movements. For freight rail, the bill is imposing four new sets of regulations with the wayside detector provision alone expected to cost the industry upwards of $90 million, and remember that includes on the short lines too, redirecting those dollars from investments in predictive technology and track improvements that are proven to make rail safe, safer. And in this effort, you are hurting the railroad's customers, the Minnesota farmers, grain elevators, and agribusinesses that depend on rail to get their goods to market efficiently. They can expect increased shipping costs and disruptions in service based on the mandates in this bill. And one development since we were last before you, the Federal Railroad Authority uh, published its federal two-person crew rule, which repeatedly recognizes the need for national uniform standards when regulating railroads. Within the commentary on that rule, the FRA re remarked that the final rule meets Congress's mandate that the laws, regulations, and orders related to railroad safety be nationally uniform and that the federal rules preventing varying state laws from creating a patchwork of potentially inconsistent rules governing train operations across the country, resulting in additional costs and operational inefficiencies. The Minnesota Regional Railroads Association recognizes there's always more to do to improve safety and drive accidents rates to zero, and we prefer to do that in a collaborative approach with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Ms. Backus. Uh, we have Reed Lidley uh, from Safety Signs, I think, wanted to testify. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Reed Leadley, and I am the Vice President of Safety Signs and also on the uh, Advisory Council on Traffic Safety representing highway contractors and construction in Minnesota. So regarding the speed safety camera legislation, um, we're very appreciative that after 10 years of uh, working on this that uh, it's being brought forward and will address the excessive speeding that we have in work zones. Also very appreciative to you of those who uh, came out on site, making site visits to understand what it's like from the worker's perspective to be next to traffic, uh, performing your work. So we know that this legislation will reduce fatalities and it will increase worker safety. And so on behalf of the men and women who work next to traffic in the construction zones and um, also the traveling public who travels through the work zones, again, we thank you for listening for realizing how important this legislation is and for taking action to enact this life-saving legislation. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leadley. All right, um, that's the end of uh, my list of folks who have signed up uh, ahead of time. Would anyone else like to uh, step forward and offer some thoughts or testimony? Anyone else? I think All right. We, there's three of us who thought we're on the list, but um, is there room for us to- Absolutely, yeah, okay. please step forward.
Thank you. We sent an email. I'm sorry why, I don't know why we didn't make it in the list, but um, That's why we opened it up at the end for folks who are, don't make it on the list. So uh, welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, um, um, Senator Dibble. My name is Ricardo Perez. Um, I am a coalition organizer with the Alliance and I help staff the Blue Line Coalition. We're here in support of the Anti-Displacement Community Prosperity Bill. Um, the Blue Line Coalition is a team of 12 organizations who have followed the Blue Line Extension project for about 10 years. When we, for us, when we think about Blue Line Extension, it's not about the train, but it's about the people. And the Anti-Displacement Community Prosperity Bill will ensure that we don't only survive as a result of our efforts during construction, but we thrive as a result of these investments. And we really appreciate you authoring the bill and helping us push it through the finish line. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Welcome. Hi, my name is Shua Salas. And to, uh, thank you, Chair, and to the committee members. Um, I'm here today for African Career Educational Resources out in Brooklyn Park. Uh, something is important is happening in our neighborhoods, and we need to talk about it. And it's about the people, <clears throat> the family like ours, who are being pushed out of their homes because they can't afford rent anymore. Um, it's about the small shops and businesses that we love that are closing down that can compete with big companies. And it's also these same companies that are also leaving our communities with large vacant buildings when <clears throat> and after they decide that it, there's nothing in it for them anymore. Uh, we see lots of changes with new buildings and everything getting expensive and while some can afford it, others cannot. And uh, and are also being left behind. Uh, some are so far behind that when I speak to some of these residents and business owners, they don't even know that the train is coming through their neighborhood. Uh, the Blue Line Co Coalition has a motto that says, it's about the line and not the people, and we want everyone to have a place and uh, that they can afford to live, and we want businesses to stay open and thrive. Most importantly, we want our neighborhoods to stay diverse and welcoming to everyone. Uh, but just saying things isn't enough. We have to do something about it and we have to set aside funds. We work together as a community to make sure our voices are heard and we at ACER are in support of the anti-displacement bill 4719 uh, so our communities can thrive. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Um, thank you, Chair Dibble and members of the committee. My name is Brandon Devonsa and I'm with the Lao Citizen Center of Minnesota. I would like to thank the committee once again with that for, for pushing forward the anti-displacement bill and acknowledging that our communities matter and getting this bill and funding to our communities is what is very important to all of us. Because with the line, we want our community to be able to stay in their homes and enjoy the benefits that come with the, uh, the public transportation and the Blue Line extension. So once again, I would like to thank you all for your hard work and acknowledging that the community is also very important to this project, and we cannot forget them in this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your coming down. All right, we will again uh, do an open call. Would anyone else like to come down and testify on Senate File 5284? All right. So we'll close this portion of the hearing. Um, we may invite folks forward. Um, to help us through um, uh, thinking through some amendments as those come up. So I know, like, Mr. for example, Mr. Benner is going to come up at some point and help us with an amendment that will be offered. Um, so with that, um, uh, we will uh, take it back to the committee and start the process of asking questions, making comments, and offering amendments. So. Um, I think uh, we had agreed that uh, we would. I would offer some or have our. I, can't really offer amendments, I'm chairing the committee. Um, but uh, so I'll just probably call on uh, Senator Bolden to offer most of my amendments. Um, so we'll start with the A4 amendment. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Greenfield is gonna help us um, because the A4 um, is kind of lengthy and it has to do with the uh, camera enforcement and I think it's taking in language um, that had been adopted by a previous committee. So. Mr. Greenfield, if you can help us understand the A4. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. That's correct. The A4 is the language that was passed out of committee, um, out of the Judiciary Committee for Senate File 2026. Um, so it's not a 
straight substitution. Um, I'll note that there are some specific page line instructions to bring the language into the shape that the um, language was as it passed out of judiciary. Judiciary passed a uh, A6 delete everything amendment to Senate file 2026 and was amended um, slightly further. Um, and so the uh, A4 is just making sure the language in the transportation supplemental omnibus is the language that passed out of judiciary. All right. Uh, questions, members? All right. Um, this is friendly or should we do a roll? Mr. Chair, uh, one second. I don't have a, a copy of the A4. Can I get a copy of the A4? Actually, I, th I, th I think it probably is not everything that you would love. <laughs> so we'll, do, we'll, go, we'll just go to a roll call. If Ms. Bol uh, Senator Bolden, if you would like to ask uh, for a roll call. Mr. Chair, I would request a roll call. We did determine that I can, as chair, ask for roll calls, but it's better if um, I don't. Um, so with that, um, the clerk will take the roll on the A4. Chair Dibble? Yes. Vice Chair Morrison? Yes. Senator Jasinski? No. Nope. Senator Bolden? Yes. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Coleman? No. Senator Herr? Aye. Senator Howe? No. Senator Lang? Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen? Um, with five yeses and four noes, the amendment prevails. All right. Um, we'll move next to the A6. Um, Senator Bolden offers the A6. I believe this has to do with um, a bill that was offered by Senator McEwen. Uh, Mr. Greenfield, if you could help us. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, that's correct. The A6 language is the uh, House version of Senate File 3949. Um, that is currently included in transportation a supplemental omnibus on the Senate side, but this brings the, the House language into the fold. Um, I'll note there are a few differences in the language, um, in particular, the uh, four-year period for um, the commissioner to not um, adjust a project that may necess necessitate relocation of a transmission line is adjusted from um, four years to seven years on page 1.15. Other, th other than that, it's mostly uh, technical changes in terms of how the language is structured. All right. With that, um, we'll just... We'll just go with the roll call unless I hear differently. Um, uh, so the clerk will take the roll on the A6. Just a, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Senator Lang. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just curious uh, um, if uh, the author of the bill is, is this uh, an amendment that she has brought forward? And maybe oh, just curious you. as to how MnDOT thinks about this. Great. Thanks. Um, to, uh, so the author of the bill is not available, but I do know that um, it was a function of uh, negotiation. Okay. Um, that she participated in. Um, and anyone who wants to come forward to speak on the A6, uh, please make your way forward. And uh, specifically, uh, we'll invite MnDOT. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Bolden. I, I would also just add, I've been in conversation with Senator McEwen about this, and this does reflect, uh, she is very much aware and has been involved, and this reflects compromise uh, work that she has been a part of. Thank you. Mr. Rudine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Eric, Chair, I guess. Oh, thank Lang. you. Thank you. Before, really, the question or the the gist of the only problem that I'm looking at is probably the fact that it's. I mean, I'm guessing these dollars are coming out of trunk highway funds, not from <laughs> possibly the uh, the utility. So I, I, I guess taking a bite at the apple. Sure. That's my question. Uh, Mr. Rudine. Uh, Mr. Chair, Eric Rudine with MnDOT Government Affairs and uh, Senator Lang. Yes, I 
I think if we if we did not provide the seven year notice to a utility, then we would have some responsibility for it, for paying a portion of the the relocation costs. So, um, you know, four years is is when projects get into our stip, and so once a project is is at that level, it, it, we we pretty well know uh, kind of what a project is going to look like. Uh, seven years will be a little bit more challenging, so you know we're going to do our our best uh, to to meet that requirement. But I would say there there probably will be cases where we're not able to meet that seven year requirement, and then we would be subject to using trunk highway funds uh, to pay a portion of those relocation costs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I guess it's I get the I get the the, the gap jumping here, so. I appreciate it. I will say um, it's better than when the bill started, uh, which put MnDOT on the hook entirely whenever there was, uh, so, I mean, it's basically utilities coming in, having access by rights to the right of way, but then MnDOT would never have anything to say about them moving um, should there be a, a need for that for the core purpose of the right of way, which is, of course, transportation, and that was unacceptable to a lot of parties, including me. Um, so this is a, a compromise. Um, uh, I do think um, we are actually providing some fund, some staffing support to MnDOT to manage this whole effort as well. So just in full disclosure, that's part of what was presented earlier in the A69. All right. Any, anything further, members, on the A6? All right. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Dibble. Yes. Vice Chair Morrison? Yes. Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Bolden? Yes. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Coleman? No. Senator Herr? Yes. Senator Howe? Senator Lang? Uh, no. Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen? Uh, with five yes votes and four no votes, the A6 passes. All right. Moving along. Oh, sorry. Uh, so we have the, uh, I'll offer, or Senator Bolden will offer the A7 amendment. And I will, I'll speak to it briefly, um, but maybe ask Mr. Greenfield's help um, as well. Uh, so what this does, uh, members, is um, if you recall, this is a, a new idea. Uh, we haven't seen this yet this year, um, uh, but we did see it last year. So it's a kind of a variation on, on an initiative from last year, which um, asks that the Metropolitan Council, it's very simple, it just asks that they continue to report to us on their efforts around keeping our uh, transit system and transit stations, or the vehicles and the stations, uh, clean and, and in good repair. Um, the initiative last year, if you recall, was to create uh, some timeliness standards on cleanliness and, and good repair. The Met Council asked us to soften that and asked us to allow them to create an initiative, which they did, and then they reported the results of that to us. Um, the requirement for uh, continued reporting on their efforts and, and results um, sunsetted, so this uh, simply perpetuates that information flowing to us on that activity of theirs. Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chair, that's a capable explanation of this amendment. Um, I. When drafting this amendment, I wanted to make sure that dates that are no longer in time are removed, so that was a technical change to reflect the adoption of those cleaning and repair standards. I'll also note, on the, in terms of a substantive change um, from last year's language, in terms of the reports that are continually to be required to be submitted to the legislature, um, I will note that there are a couple of slight differences in Clause 4 and Clause 6. Um, clause 6, in particular, recommends changes to the transit improvement program that was adopted, uh, enacted last year as part of uh, the transportation omnibus. So this kind of marriages, uh, marries the cleaning and standards with the transit and rider investment program. Thank you. 
got a thumbs up from the Met Council in the audience, so I won't ask them to come forward. That's good enough for me. And I uh, got a thumbs up from my uh, counterpart. Um, and so uh, I'll ask for questions. All right. Um, and so then I'll just call for a vote. We don't need a roll call. All in favor of the A7, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, so Senator Bolden will now offer the A8. Um, and we'll invite Mr. Benner forward to help us understand. Um, this again, uh, members, is something new. We haven't seen the subject. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, around uh, expanding uh, a little bit of information and data that we would be collecting on a report um, that we already asked for. Um, but we're trying to get a little bit more information to understand a little better what's going on in the area of privatization. Mr. Benner. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Pat Benner. I'm a legislative representative with AFSCME Council 5. Uh, we are a public and private sector union representing 43,000 workers across the state of Minnesota, including frontline workers at MnDOT. Uh, I'm here today to speak in support of the A8 amendment, uh, which adds some additional reporting requirements for the Taxpayers' Transportation Accountability Act, or TTAA. Uh, in 2008, as part of the Supplemental Transportation Omnibus Bill, uh, the legislature uh, established some new policies for MnDOT to ensure that the taxpayer gets the best value for their constitutionally dedicated spending on transportation. Uh, it required that uh, before contracting out a project uh, whose tasks typically fall uh, within the scope of work that our members do, so this is uh, road maintenance, inspection, and design, uh, that the department uh, must assemble an internal bid so long as the contract is valued over $100,000. Uh, there is a list of contracts that uh, this language does not apply to that is earlier in the underlying statute, which I can procure for you if you'd like. Um, and if the contract uh, exceeds $250,000, the agency must accomplish the project internally if the agency bid is cheaper. Uh, for contracts between $100,000 and $250,000, uh, it's discretionary within the department. Uh, the goal of the law was to provide the accountability and transparency that we as taxpayers deserve and to utilize public services when practicable. Uh, however, since 2009, only one contract has ever been stopped and instead accomplished uh, by MnDOT employees, and that project occurred in 2011. 882 projects have been documented through this process since 2009, uh, which is a 0.11% rate of avoiding privatization. Uh, the reason is obvious when you read the reports. Uh, in the second appendix of each annual report, they list the reason for privatization. It's almost universally staff limitations within scheduled time frame. We don't have the people. Uh, and the reason we don't have the people is that MnDOT employees' uh, wages not only haven't kept up with, uh, with inflation, with cost of living, or the private sector, but also fallen woefully behind other public sector positions doing similar road maintenance and snowplow tasks. Uh, this amendment will better quantify uh, where and how we are short. Uh, this amendment doesn't change any underlying practices for privatization at MnDOT, but the public deserves to better understand why their gas taxes aren't getting the bang for their buck that they deserve. Uh, I hope you all vote yes on the A8 amendment, and I uh, stand for questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Benner. Questions, members? Um, I don't know if uh, MnDOT wanted to respond at this point or not. It's kind of new to them. It's kind of a late breaker. Um, but in fairness, and this is a hearing, so uh, I think we would want to get at least an initial response so that we have information on the record. Welcome, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Nancy Daubenberger, and I'm the Commissioner for, the, for MnDOT, and uh, we have not uh, had time to dig through this yet and understand what sort of... Um, uh, resources be needed to meet the intention of this legislation. Um, it's correct that we are, are already um, 
doing this reporting from an overall standpoint, and this would um, have us look more at a district level and bridge office level, I believe, and then aggregate it. So um, data that we're already collecting, but not sure what the impact would be for us to be able to pull this all together. We need a little more time to review that. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, um, as this, uh, should this be successful amendments, um, and as this bill moves forward, to finance and or the floor and or conference. Let's uh, continue uh, with that conversation. Um, and also, not sure if Mr. Benner touched on it or not, um, but um, my interest would be <clears throat> to see if we can't um, engage the legislative auditor to really drill down and help us understand um, if in fact uh, um, the the move to, to privatize is actually getting us away from delivering some of these key services. You know, this is particularly around uh, operations and maintenance of, of our roadway system. Um, and and, and, and I, I think it's accepted that uh, privatization um, either fills in a gap or creates some sort of efficiencies that's not always borne out by the evidence. Um, so I think we would like the legislative auditor who is unassailable and really digging in and helping us determine in an objective manner what is the best route to go on key policy questions, key, in, key questions of public interest like this. Um, so this would help us get some data that then perhaps the legislative auditor in a program review um, could take a look at the, you know, for the following year and bring some recommendations and some insight back to us. So this is kind of laying the foundation for what would hopefully be a successful effort persuading the Audit Commission to take this project on. So that's the idea here. All right, further questions? All right, um, so the clerk will take the roll on the A8. Chair Dibble? Yes. Vice Chair Morrison? Yes. Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Bolden? Yes. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Coleman? No. Uh, Senator Her. Yes. Senator Howe. No. Yes. Senator Lang. No. Senator McEwen. Senator McEwen. All right, with uh, five yes votes and four no votes, the A8 is adopted. All right, so Senator uh, Bolden will offer the A10 amendments. Uh, and members, um, the A10 um, is, uh, I know, is opposed by our friends in the railroad industry. Um, this would um, take the uh, amount of insurance, liability, coverage for railroad uh, carriers. So if we remember the testimony on that bill, um, that's the instances where uh, railroad employees are transported um, over the roadway system from their workplace to home and vice versa. Um, and uh, the proposal was to require railroads to offer five million uh, up to $5 million of liability insurance should there be an unfortunate incident in, in transporting. Um, just in full transparency, um, uh, the, the Chair of, of Commerce um, looked at this. He doesn't necessarily need to uh, bring this uh, question into his uh, committee, um, but, but did ask that we find a compromise um, position, um, and that's what this proposal reflects. Um, Senator Kupek, um, who is the chief author, um, has agreed to this compromise position, um, and so um, so that's what I offer, or what Senator Bolden offers. Uh, questions? 
Senator Drzezinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Not so much a question, but a comment. Uh, it's a step in the right direction. I get that, but uh, still much more comfortable with the million, which is, uh, I believe, where it should be. Uh, again, these costs are just being passed on uh, to the, the users, uh, which actually eventually gets down to Minnesotans paying taxes on their products. So uh, I, it is a step in the right direction, so we do appreciate that, but uh, again, I think it should be at the million dollar level. So I'll be voting no. Thank you. Further questions? All right. Uh, with that, uh, the clerk will take the roll on the A10, please. Chair Dibble? Yes. Vice Chair Morrison? Yes. Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Bolden? Yes. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Coleman? No. Senator Herr? Yes. Senator Howe? Yes. Senator Lang? No. Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen? With uh, five yes votes and four no votes, the A-10 is adopted. All right, thank you. Um, so maybe we'll have Senator Carlson offer the A-12 amendment. Um, and I know Senator Howe shares an interest in the subject as well. Um, and this has to do with pavement life cycle cost analysis. I'll invite Mr. Bag, oh, Mr. Bagnoli's not here. Whomever can uh, help us, this is a new issue. Um, uh, Abby Breidick is here, I think, as well. So this is kind of a compromise or a proverbial piece in the valley, I believe, between asphalt and concrete on uh, asking the Department of Transportation um, to do a process where they analyze selection of uh, one of those paving materials or the other based on a set of criteria. And now we're at the end of my familiarity with this subject. So I don't know, Senator Carlson, did you want to share some thoughts? Senator Howe, you're well versed on this before we proceed. Um. All right. well, th thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I actually uh, carried uh, something very similar to this. I think it's a, a, a good idea to know exactly uh, uh, what we're doing, what if we're going to do a project, what the best solution for the project and get the most bang for the buck out of the project is. So taxpayers, when they put a dollar into a road system, they know it's going to pay off and give us a, a good long-term fix or the best long-term fix for the roadway. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Greenfield can help us uh, a little bit here. Oh, I'm sorry. Before that, uh, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I would... Uh, echo everything that uh, Senator Howe said, that uh, this allows for good planning for replacement as well, and uh, making sure that we do get the best for our dollar. Great. Uh, sorry. Senator Lang wanted to... No, in. I was just going to speak in support of the amendment as well, uh, Mr. Chair. And, um, you know, I visited quite a few road projects over the last summer, and uh, some of the dollars and cents when it comes down to it, and how much longer some of our roads would last with an inch or two more of concrete. Uh, but uh, you know, we're always pinching pennies around here uh, on our projects as much as possible, and I think this is probably a good way to, uh, again, jump the gap. So right. there we are. Very good. Uh, so for the, uh, for the good of the order, and so we have it on the public record, um, Mr. Greenfield is going to help us understand the A12 a little better. Mr. Chair and members, that's correct. Um, I will note that the underlying language is pulled from Senate File 4896, uh, and there were some changes that were done to the underlying amendment that are not in, that, uh, that are different from the bill as introduced. Um, Subdivision 2A in the as introduced version is deleted in this amendment, and that amendment uh, pertains to an excess fuel cost uh, fuel consumption calculation as part of the life cycle cost analysis. And there are two references in the subdivision before about required analysis that pertain to that um, excess fuel consumption criteria or a calculation that was to be performed by the department. But since that's been removed, those other two references in subdivision two are also removed as well as part of the overall analysis for um, pavement life cycle. 
Thank you. Anyway, have someone at the table, please introduce yourself for the record. Uh, yes, my name is Dan LeBeau. I'm with the uh, Executive Director for the Concrete Paving Association of Minnesota. I'll keep my testimony very brief. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Um, just want to testify that this bill is kind of compromise language that cleared the uh, committees two years ago and made it into the conference committee. It cleared that, but it didn't have a final vote. So generally speaking, the, uh, there's broad industry agreement on this bill, on the language. It's a compromised version, as we, we talked about. We feel that it is a, uh, a good use of, the, of MnDOT's time and effort to run a life cycle cost analysis to ensure that we are making the best decision in what this uh, bill does. It's modeled after a OLA report that was done in 2014, so it fundamentally brings forward those recommendations into uh, codified law. And with that, uh, we encourage you to pass the amendment as is, and we look forward to uh, it becoming law. Thank you. I see Ms. Breidick making her way up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, my name is Abby Breidick, uh, Director of the Minnesota Asphalt Payment Association. Um, I did just want to let the committee know that since this uh, language was devised of a few years ago, we've had multiple meetings with the department, and we do have meetings scheduled throughout this summer and fall to continue talking about ways that there can be more, let's say, sunlight on the LCCA process. I want to make sure that you all know that we currently do LCCAs for every project. There's an annual report that comes out that shows exactly what was evaluated and what the decision was. Um, MnDOT can tell more about that process, but um, in, in an instance where maybe legislation is no longer needed because the conversations that have ne needed to happen are happening, um, this might be an opportunity to forego that. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Nancy Daubenberger. I'm the Commissioner for MnDOT, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide comments on this amendment. We've previously shared our concerns with the proposed changes to pavement life cycle cost analysis, and appreciate the opportunity to do that again. Um, MnDOT's life cycle cost analysis was developed over many years using experience gained from paths, methods and review of other state DOT processes, the Federal Highway Administration guidance, academic papers, and input from industry stakeholders. So the current process, based on substantial research and stakeholder input, allows MnDOT district's discretion to use an alternate bid process to select pavement types based on factors like constructability, pavement type continuity, traffic control issues, and effects on businesses. So prioritizing long-term fixes could negatively impact um, rural roads with lower traffic volumes. Requiring long-term solutions on all projects could mean that rural roads with lower traffic volumes fall into disrepair as short-term repaving projects are scrapped for longer-term fixes for the higher volume roads. As we previously noted, our recommendation is to direct the department to work with stakeholders to study issues related to pavement selection. And as Ms. Breidach mentioned, we, in fact, have already um, have these, had some of these meetings with industry um, stakeholders and have additional ones set up. And so um, with that, thank you for the opportunity to share MnDOT's concerns with this amendment. I stand for questions. Great. Questions for the commissioner? Uh, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner, I think some of the frustrations that we hear from some of the contractors out there is they're, they're doing a, a very similar road with similar uh, traffic on it in one district, and they're using one type of, of uh, construction type there, one type of but yet they go to another district and it's got the very similar roadway, very similar traffic, and they're doing a completely different uh, process there. And I think that's the frustration, especially when you're bidding projects and you would think that having it at the central office coming out with actually a report saying, hey, for this pro type of a project, this is the best fit for that, I think would bring some uniformity across the state as far as these types of roads get this type of, a, of treatment in a, a process and, and a construction. And I think that would alleviate some of the concerns that it seems like they've, 
that, that old adage, well, we've always done it this way. And we're not applying the new techniques in some of the areas that we probably could have. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Did you want thank to respond? You. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Howe. Um, I can appreciate that frustration from contractors and uh, uh, MnDOT's central office does get involved with pavement selections and review of LCCAs. Uh, they, uh, an individual district in selecting a pavement type will go through this LCCA, but as, as I mentioned earlier, there could be other factors that go into what the ultimate pavement type selection is when it comes to looking at what sort of pavements out there, what future plans are for the road, what um, would be going on with a certain type of um, fix within this roadway based on business impacts, things like that go into those decisions. So it's, it's um, project by project, needs, every project needs to take into account different considerations. But um, MnDOT central office does get involved and industry input is very important to us and that's why we're gonna continue to have these meetings where we get that industry input. Thank you, Senator. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I did kind of hear there was peace in the valley on this from other people, but listening to some of your testimony and just thinking of kind of the local control side of things, I think there are sometimes other factors that can lead into you know, the availability of contractors, the availability of materials, the pricing and things like that. So, you know, I think we should be giving our, our district engineer some flexibility uh, to understand their own local areas and things like that. So I, I do understand there's some, you know, peace in the valley from the, from the groups, but uh, listening to uh, Commissioner Dobbenberger, I think I would like to give MnDOT some flexibility with their district engineers to make those local decisions on how things are done. Because I know a lot of things has availability of what contractors are available at what times and those things and what materials are available in each individual district. Uh, some may be heavier on, on other materials than others, so uh, again, I, everybody will probably vote on their own on this, but uh, I think MnDOT has some good concerns over this, and I think the local control issue with each individual district engineer uh, making those decisions, obviously they have recommendations and can see things, but I, I think I favor more in of giving the local uh, district engineers their choice on, on what to do, so thank you. Commissioner, did you have a response? That, thank you, All Senator right. Jasinski, I appreciate that. All right. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I'll just uh, weigh in a little bit here, too. Um, uh, obviously, this issue has been around forever. I actually understand it better than I let on. Um, so I am, I am, you know, I, I uh, am firmly on everyone's side on this one, <laughs> like a good politician. Um, everyone does have a really, really good perspective and a really good argument to make uh, on this subject. Um, you know, I know, and I... I Recognize that MnDOT has been working on this for, for a number of years um, as well. We do need to strike the balance, um, you know, with uh, at least one of the groups uh, feels like um, they, they just don't, you know, to Senator Howell's point, they just don't get, um, uh, you know, really to get in to kind of make their cost effective case. Um, so, you know, I'll be voting in favor, um, but, but we'll also send a strong signal even though this had made it into a package uh, a, a number of years ago, time passes, we learn more, um, we gain perspective, um, and uh, would hope that uh, you know, some of the points that have been raised by MnDOT, by Senator Jasinski and others um, uh, will be taken into consideration and it'll be changed before the final bill is, is passed and, and sent to the governor. Um, I will also note, uh, maybe Ms. Boyd can help us uh, does trigger a fiscal note, uh, so we just need to be aware that this carries a cost, like 1.5. Mr. Boyd. Chair, that's right. The, the underlying bill, Senate File 4896, did have a completed fiscal note. Um, I don't think this language varies much from that bill. Um, we'd have to look at if it, it varies significantly, but the, the fiscal note um, basically says that uh, MnDOT is assuming nine employees would be needed across MnDOT's districts, and that would so that would be all staff costs, so 1.5 million a year, I believe, from the Trunk Highway Fund. Yes. Thank you. All right. Anything further, members? All right. The clerk will take the roll on the A48. I'm sorry. What did I say? Oh, I have. Where is it? Oh, sorry. I've been shuffling uh, papers in front of myself here. The A12, thank you. Chair Dibble? Yes. Vice Chair Morrison? 
Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Bolden? Yes. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Coleman? No. Senator Herr? Yes. Senator Howe? Yes. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator McEwen? Vice Chair Morrison? Yes. Senator McEwen? Uh, with seven yes votes and two no votes, the A-12 is adopted. Senator Lang uh, would like to offer an amendment. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A-65 amendment. 55? There's, there's two on the same subject. So. Hang on. Do you have... I, we have the A55 and the A65. Mr. Greenfield says A65 is better than the A55. <laughs> well, I maybe could speak to all three different versions of the, the relatively the, the same amendment, the A65 being the most recent, Mr. Chair. Um, and I appreciate your uh, leniency a little bit with working with me on that one. Uh, realistically, all this amendment is, is doing is clarifying some of the uh, the road construction materials that are hauled from, thank you. Uh, the road construction materials that are hauled from processing plant to job, or excuse me, from port to processing plant to job site. And in the past, this has been somewhat of a, a point of contention on what is and what is not road construction projects. And realistically, my intent is to have an amendment that addresses the road construction materials uh, to and from the plant, the boulevards, the, the uh, curb, gutter, and sidewalks, and that, that is the intent. Now, I, I do know that there are some, possibly some differing uh, opinions on how we include all that, so uh, I, I'd like to think this is a friendly amendment, but it's also a stepping stone to move forward, so. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, I would consider it friendly. Um, I'll just mention um, I've had conversations with Mr. Seifert and Mr. Macarios, who's coming in right now. Um, and I think there is uh, an agreement to your point um, that um, th this kind of clarifies what is currently the practice, that uh, um, the material from the plant going to the road construction um, only. Um, and, and this kind of clarifies that and clears up some of that ambiguity. Um, and, uh, and I think that it helps, it helps the matter. Um, and uh, so the language is, you know, was modified a little bit from earlier today just to make sure that we're, we are talking specifically about uh, material that relates to, to road construction and, you know, similar to the sugar beet uh, subject that we had going right from one specific place to another. There's a broad agreement um, with MnDOT and locals um, uh, with distribution of weight across axles and those sorts of things that help mitigate and minimize wear and tear. Uh, and, and safety issues, um, and so it seems, and you know, frankly, it's, it is a clarification of, of the world as we know it today. Mr. Uh, Chair? Senator Bolden. I am not seeing an A65, do we, is that in our packets? Uh, I don't know. We will uh, make sure it gets in front of you. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll pause for a moment. Um, did uh, Mr. Seifert or Mr. Macarios want to come forward and offer some thoughts? Afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Marty Seifer with the uh, Aggregate and Ready Mix Association. And thank you for uh, working on, uh, on this and meeting with us on this, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're trying our best to make sure we get from terminal to processing plant. We don't have the exact way of segregating things for only road once it leaves the processing plant. We know it goes to road or not, but on the way in, we don't. So I think we'll work with MnDOT and trying to get that exact clarification as we move to conference committee. and. I, I want peace in the valley, Mr. Chairman. I, I think we've, we're have we better than Gaza or Ukraine, but not quite Switzerland. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seifert. 
All right, does everyone see the, have the A65 in front of them? All right, looks like Mr. Mercarios is just Mr. monitoring the situation. <laughs> Thumbs up, all right. So, uh, oh, we are searching for it. Mr. Chair. Mr. Greenfield. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we are making copies upstairs. They should be available for distribution. I'd recommend that we just move on for the time being and then just come back and adopt the amendment once everyone has a physical copy in front of them at the committee. Great. Um, hopefully that'll be soon. I know that uh, Mr. Senator Lang has to depart soon. So what's the, what's the proper laid on the table or just? I would lay it on the table very All briefly. All right. I'd the, make that motion, Mr. Chair. All right, the A65 is on the table. Do we need to vote on it? All right, so the A65 is on the table. We'll move on to another amendment in the meantime. So I will offer the A54 amendment. Is that in front of it? Should be in front of in our packet. All right. Um, so members, this has to do with um, a question uh, that had come up around the collection of uh, passenger fares for inner city passenger rail. Um, and there was a, uh, some concern about um, some exemption, you know, full, a full exemption from state law on how we govern fees in state law. So no, no, so the law, as is stated, um, doesn't allow any state agency to unilaterally enact a fee or change um, the, the, the price of a, of a fee. Um, and uh, the Department of Transportation was looking for a full exemption uh, from that provision. Um, it's a concern um, that I had share with, with um, uh, my counterpart, the lead, um, and so the A54 is is an attempt um, to to just to continue the conversation to see what makes sense with the Department of Transportation. It does not seem to make sense to give the Department of Transportation a complete exemption from uh, all laws that govern enactment and the increasing the price of fees, um, and so um, so this language would would it at, at least um, uh, tamp down the ability to increase fees. It's not a desire to get in and start setting fares, but it's a it's a desire just to continue the conversation um, through the pro through the conference committee process. So that's my proposal, Senator Drusinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, uh, thank you for uh, working through this bill. And, and uh, again, I, as I said, we had some concerns in the beginning on the bill, and we've really been working to try and eliminate some of those concerns, and this is one of them. Uh, so I would support the uh, A54. All right, questions, members? All right, all in favor say aye. Aye, opposed say no, motion carries. All right, I will offer the, I will offer the uh, A48, um, and then I'm gonna actually lean on Mr. Greenfield to help us understand it. Um, uh, and this is uh, uh, language as adopted by the other body on the subject of uh, zero emission uh, transit initiative, which um, I strongly support, um, but I'm very sensitive to the testimony that we heard from the Met Council, as well as representatives of Greater Minnesota Transit, um, that we may need to do the proverbial soft landings, um, soften up the proposal a little bit. Um, I feel strongly uh, about putting these strong policies in place because it spurs agencies and it spurs the private sector uh, and creates a very strong market signal so that innovation occurs more rapidly than would otherwise. Um, but at the same time, as we did in a number of other areas, including conservation and efficiency, um, renewable energy standard and the like, <clears throat> um, we did maintain some connection to the, the reality and the fact that, that the technology, the product, the services that we're wanting the public sector to lead on uh, may not come about uh, as quickly as possible. And if you were to read the analysis, this would, you know, and, and Ms. Munyan's testimony and others, um, 
we could get a result that we really don't intend. So this maintains a strong policy in place, but then allows for uh, just some, some softening of that if what doesn't come true, what we hope comes to come true doesn't come true in as timely uh, or as cost effective a way uh, on a time frame that we would hope. So Mr. Greenfield, if you can help us understand the a, uh, a capable summary of the language um, that is correct that yesterday as, as part of the House uh, supplemental finance bill, there were provisions related to the zero emission transit buses and then there was an additional amendment adopted to that. So this is the reflection of the amendment to the amendment and the amendment kind of merged together and then placed into the Senate file 5284. Um, so uh, section one uh, of note, the, the, the amendment does delete two sections, the first of which is the procurement requirement uh, that was uh, amended in, 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 um, in, in rollout to uh, exempt rural service providers uh, and only apply to uh, the procurement requirement to those who provide trans, uh, buses for the urban serv uh, service area, but that has been removed from the language. Subdivision two essentially reworks and, and reclassifies the, the procurement exemption process um, that um, links in the procurement exception uh, process for both um, MnDOT transit buses as well as uh, the Metropolitan Councils. There's a kind of a list of the, the entities um, requirements for when they submit a an application for an exemption, including a justification, a review of the activities for transition planning, demonstration of efforts to procure zero emission transit buses, a proposed timeline for full compliance, and information required by the commissioner. And the commissioner may only issue a procurement exemption following a determination the applicant has made a good faith effort to follow the guidance and recommendations of the transition plan adopted by the Metropolitan Council and full compliance with procurement requirements is not feasible within the specific, specified time period due to a variety of factors beginning on 1.27 all the way until 2.1 on the next page. Then uh, the next set of instructions deletes the and reinserts with um, some changes the uh, Metropolitan Council's portion of the zero emission bus procurement requirements. Um, section 108, the new section 108 is um, establishing the, the bus procurement requirements of note in paragraph C. This is the push out of the requirement that any qualified transit bus purchased for regular route transit service or special transportation service, i.e. Um, um, is, is required to be a zero emission bus beginning on January 1, 2035, rather than the as introduced version or the version in rollout of January 1, 2030. Uh, of note that uh, in paragraph B, right above that, there's still a requirement that 50% of the qualified transit buses annually purchased uh, meet a, are a zero emission transit bus. Um, so this is, I think, the function of uh, an off-ramp that Senator Dibble was, was discussing. Um, section 109 makes modifications to the Metropolitan Council Zero Emission Transit Bus Plan. Um, it is largely, um, a largely technical reorganization of that section. I don't believe that there's too many differences beyond, of course, at the end of section uh, of the section, beginning in paragraph B, that institutes the beginning on January 1, 2035 requirement uh, for the procurement of zero emission transit buses uh, moving forward. So it does push it out another five years than what uh, is currently in the A3 Delete Everything Amendment. All right, questions, members? Senator Drzezinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for this amendment. Um, it does make the bill a little bit better, but this is one of our big concerns of this portion of the bill. Uh, it's just going to cost uh, Minnesota a lot more money. I think we're seeing almost double the cost in buses. I know the scope of this has come down uh, since there's not a big target for this, uh, but um, still have a concern with this. It is moving in the right direction. Um, we can do a voice vote. It's not a big deal, but uh, still not where I want to see it, but uh, we can go ahead from there. Great. Thank you. Did anyone want to testify on the A48 proposal? All right. Um, anything further, members? All in favor of the A48, say aye. 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 Opposed saying, oh, you know what? Let me back up. I think I offered that amendment that's not allowed, so we'll say Senator Carlson has offered the A48 for the record. All right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion. No. Oh. Motion carries. All right. All right. We'll go back. We'll return to uh, A65. Senator Lang. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to pull oh. A65 from the table. We take it from the table officially. All right, it's back before us. Uh, further questions? I'd stand for any questions. All right. Uh, all in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Uh, I think that's I think that's it for me. Sorry, I have one more. Uh, sorry about that. Um, Senator Bolden will offer the A18. And um, this is, I believe, coming from uh, Senator McEwen. And Mr. Greenfield, can you help us understand it? I think it has to do with the limited licenses uh, for treatment court purposes. Mr. Chair, it involves the reintegration driver's license oh, fix that was not included uh, as part of any Senate file, but was included in rollout. This is just further clarification language about when the reinstatement fee um, that is assessed to people who have had their driver's license revoked, canceled, suspended, have to pay, but for purposes of the reintegration fee, it was the intent of the legislature enacting last year and the intent of Senator McEwen and what will be the practice of the agency to not assess that um, reinst uh, to the reapplication fee for purposes of a reinstatement, dr uh, a reintegration driver's license. Right, right. Thank you. Questions on the A18? All right. All in favor of the A18 say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. All right. Uh, amendments, members, or questions or comments? Uh, can we go, Senator Bolden has one and then we'll jump Mr. to you, Senator Mr. Chair, I would offer the A4 amendment. Senator Bolden offers the A4. Oh. One second. Mr. Chair, if that is not ready, we could move on and come back. I think you want the A23. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Move the A23 amendment. All right. Is that in our packet? No. It's coming around. Mr. Chair. Senator Bolden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, uh, members, is related to a Senator Coleman bill about motorcycle lane filtering. Um, I appreciate the robust discussion we had about this uh, in committee. I will say I have some concerns about the language as is, um, as a mom of a son who was nearly killed and left permanently disabled by a motorcycle accident and being a nurse, having taken care of many, many patients uh, in the hospital after motorcycle crashes, um, I you know, will say that motorcycle safety is of the utmost importance to me. Um, uh, and he, after hearing sort of both sides uh, you know, folks talk about, you know, this is safer, it's not safer. I'm not convinced that it is safer. And so instead of um, moving to allow that, uh, this language would change it to do a study to get some evidence to see is it actually safer uh, before we would enact that. Thank you. Uh, questions, uh, members, to the A23? And I know Senator Coleman probably has, oh, I see her hand is up. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members, um, for considering the concept of lane filtering in Minnesota. Um, I would oppose this amendment and would ask for a no vote. We have plenty of data that have come out from other states uh, that show that it actually does make life safer for motorcyclists out there. So I think that would be just an inefficient use of time and resources. Um, and so would ask that we vote no and move forward with this uh, proven method. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator Coleman. Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, you know, being an avid motor motorcycle rider for many, many years, and I, I think I, I kind of maybe touched on the very uh, beginnings of what I was trying to get at during the committee hearing, and maybe I should have gone a little more in depth. This is a safety aspect, especially for me. When we are uh, out on the highway, I, I, like I said earlier, the, the chances of me riding just a little bit faster than the flow of traffic for my own safety happens all the time. I want to be able to be moving in and around vehicles. I want to be able to be between cars so that if I don't am not seen, I don't get rear-ended. That was always the one piece where when I was riding, it was always a car right on your tail. And having this option, having the ability to go between lanes, uh, how counterintuitive it may seem is safer, I'm telling you. I've been there, I've seen it. I've had people pull out in front of me and I've had people come right up on your rear tire with tires squealing, waiting just to get hit. And if you can be between the cars, it is going to be safer. And I, I don't, that might all be anecdotal, uh, but I'm telling you, I, I spent a lot of times on the highway. Uh, I've been in a couple motorcycle crashes. I can tell you that it was, uh, it was once a deer's fault and once another driver's fault. Uh, and being a, in a, uh, a defensive posture on the highway, uh, like I said, counterintuitive, but being able to go between the cars is, is a very safe option. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Lang. Senator Jasinski. Mr. Chair, I think as, uh, as I've discussed before, I have some concerns over this, uh, but I think Senator Coleman made a good point. I think there's plenty of studies out there uh, about this and, and proven that it is safe. So I guess the dollar amount to me is the issue of spending money that there's data out there already. So uh, with that, I would be... Uh, against the amendment. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Howe. <coughs> <Never. laughs> I, I really, really want to hear from you. I'm just going to parrot what everybody just said, so I won't All make right. a comment. All right. Very good. All right. Um, with that, uh, the clerk will take the... I don't think anyone asked for a roll call, but I think, I think yeah, but we didn't indicate unless we hear differently, we'll go with a roll call, so... Um, We'll, um, the clerk will take the roll on the A23. Chair Dibble? Uh, no. Vice Chair Morrison? Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Bolden? Yes. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Coleman? No. Senator Her? Yes. Senator Howe? No. Senator Lang? No. Senator McEwen? Vice Chair Morrison? Yes. Senator McEwen? With four yeses and five noes, the 823 is not adopted. Mr. Mr. Chair. Senator Howe. Uh, keeping in line with uh, the motorcycle lane splitting, uh, as a person that has done this before when I rode in California, and that was the law out there is 40 miles an hour, I believe. I, I, would, I do believe that that might be a little bit fast in my opinion and I've talked this over with the with the author of this bill or the author of this uh, part of the bill Senator Coleman and uh, we've agreed to possibly lower that to make make an oral amendment on line 56.4 page 56 line 4 delete 40 and insert 25 All right. Um, does everyone understand the amendment? Senator, uh, Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chair and members, I just want to repeat the oral amendment that's been put forth by Senator Howe. On page 56, it would delete 40, 40, and insert 25, 25. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, questions, members? All right. 
So, <laughs> all right. Um, I don't know if Senator Coleman specifically wanted to weigh in or not. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I consider this a friendly amendment. I think we can just do a voice vote on it if you'd like. All right. Thank you. All in favor of the Howe Amendment as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. I'm done with my amendments. Mr. Right. Mr. Chair. Oh, oh uh, maybe I'm not, but I'll come back. Okay. Uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A33 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A33. Oh, coming around. Maybe it is in your packet. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. As we've discussed for many, many years, and I always will say Senator Newman uh, has brought this to my attention, but uh, it uh, talks about leakages uh, from the HUTDF fund. Uh, what this would do would take, uh, and, and the Trunk Highway Fund, sorry, would take 450000 uh, from the Trunk Highway Fund uh, from MnDOT Central Building Security Upgrades. Again, I think about 25% of this uh, is probably not attributable to uh, that, so I'd like to take the $450,000 and uh, transfer it over to the Corridors of Commerce. All right, so uh, members, um, uh, I would find this uh, amendment friendly. Uh, this fulfills our agreement and understanding that, as, to repeat Senator Jasinski, um, that MnDOT's headquarters, I believe, are primarily used in an for Trunk Highway support and appropriately um, is supported, the building itself is supported by Trunk Highway funds, but we acknowledge that a number of the activities, services that are provided in the building uh, don't have the Trunk Highway Fund nexus, and so we've started the policy slash practice of trying to support that the building, um, whether those are capital or operating needs, um, with a mix of Trunk Highway and general funds. Um, so there is a proposal actually being carried primarily in another bill. It has to do with security upgrades on the campus. The MnDOT portion of that, um, Trunk Highway funds were identified as the source for that overall multi-building project on the campus to upgrade security, and we simply uh, reduce that amount um, by 75%. We don't necessarily identify the general funds. We don't backfill it um, ourselves. Um, we'll leave that to someone else, some other committee to do so, but it acknowledges the spirit of the 75-25 split uh, for MnDOT headquarters. And then, of course, the money that, that frees up in the Trunk Highway Fund is put towards corridors. So with that, uh, questions, members? All right. Um, I think you can probably go to a voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. no. Motion carries. All right. Amendments, members? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A58 amendment. Uh, so the A58 has been passed out. Senator Drzinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe the, the department has uh, assumed the responsibility of 100000 uh, from the general fund, or from the, from the department, uh, absorb the cost. So I believe there's 100000 available. Uh, and what I'd like to do is uh, distribute that 100000 uh, to MnDOT uh, to purchase an autonomous mower, which we've been discussing as part of my bill this year. Uh, and with that, I'd stand for questions. All right, questions, members, on the A58. Um, all right, yeah, there was a, a, an item that we had put $100,000 towards. Turns out fiscal note didn't call for $100,000, and so we're redirecting those to the purpose of a bill that we approved earlier. All right, um, all in favor of the A58, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. All right. Amendments, member. Uh, Senator th Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have the uh, A13 amendment. Senator Lang offers the A13. That is uh, in your packets. Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, an amendment that has to deal with uh, Senator Muhammad's uh, 3526 bill. It really goes just for clarificational 
purposes uh, to the, the pedestrian malls that we talked about, the, the red painted pedestrian malls that uh, that will line 1.6 would provide the movement of police fire equipment other emergency vehicles would not be impeded I think that's an important distinction and then the on lines 1.10 uh, that when it ha crosses an intersection or uh, that the cities that are adopting these roadways have to consult with uh, other road authorities being the county or the uh, the state uh, so that the cities have to get uh, those proposed pedestrian malls with other road authorities uh, that any changes in traffic flow that have to go through the the, uh, the approval process. So I think that's uh, kind of just a mainly a clarification and common sense uh, approach to that bill. So. Thank you. Um, questions, members. I'll say um, before I go to questions, um, got the thumbs up from the city of Minneapolis a second ago, and this of course has been under discussion for a few days, um, and this is something that they would probably do anyways. Um, we, of course, want, you know, police and fire equipment to be able to cross over pedestrian malls, and we also want there to be um, some consultation um, with uh, intersecting road authorities, and so it's it's fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just wondering if Senator Muhammad is aware of and has waited on this language. I think she is, but I'll look to Mr. Huser. Uh, Mr. Huser, is Senator Muhammad aware of this change? Uh, Mr. Huser. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Huser, City of Minneapolis. Um, I did make the Senator aware of this language. Um, this is uh, kind of practice for this type of use of right of way. We would want to have emergency vehicles have access, um, and we think it's prudent to have conversations with other road jurisdictions where our right of ways come next, you know butt to each other so and I did make the senator aware of that we would likely be entertaining this change all right anything further on the laying a 13 all right all in favor say aye aye opposed say no motion carries amendments members senator Lang uh, thank you mr. chair I have the a 72 Senator Lang offers the A72. I didn't realize our amendments had gotten up that high. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chair, I'm trying to be efficient. <laughs> All right. Um, go ahead, uh, Senator Lang, on the Th A72. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This, this goes uh, right along uh, with the last amendment, and it uh, talks about what we constitute residential districts. We want to make sure that uh, these pedestrian right-of-way areas don't go through a rural residential uh, neighborhood, and this uh, language goes along with that. So. Um, thank you. Questions, members, on the A72? Mr. Huser is coming back to the table. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to know if, uh, I think, same question. If, I'll just go ahead and ask. Um, is Senator Muhammad aware of the A72? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, Steve Huser again, City of Minneapolis. I'm not sure if she's aware of this specific amendment. Um, uh, speaking on behalf of the city of Minneapolis, we would have concerns with this language uh, today. Um, we do think that there would be scenarios where um, I'll start at the purpose of the legislation is to provide an opportunity for local governments to have conversations about reimagining the use of right of way. Um, this restriction would impede some of that conversation that we are trying to achieve with the underlying legislation. Uh, we understand, you know, the purpose of it. I don't think it's a nefarious amendment, but um, we would have some concerns because there could be situations where we would want to use areas that would be designated as residential that could potentially be uh, this reuse of right of way could connect um, things like a park with a business district or things like that. So we would like to keep our options open within our right of way. Thank you, Mr. User. Uh, members, anything further? Um, so, uh, Senator Zinsky, um, so just uh, uh, Folks aren't aware. Um, Senator Jasinski and and uh, his staff um, worked on a number of these issues. Asked me my feelings um, about them. Some of them I was open to, pending further information. I had indicated an openness to this, but um, I'm tilting against it. Just so you're aware, I know I know that you did a lot of work in finding the language here. Maybe we can keep keep the conversation going um, on things like this. Um, but at this point, I will be a no vote. Senator Jasinski. Senator Mr. Lane. Chair, thanks. I, I think, you know, we talked about this uh, prior to in the residence district being 
districted that way or being zoned that way, I still think the language would allow the city to make that distinction, uh, you know, with the zoning capability, was my understanding. Uh, and was that the case? Did, did you understand the point, or Mr. Greenfield? Mr. Chair, I could check into that for Senator Lang what the issue might be, but yeah, we can. I can do some digging into that issue. Okay. So at this point, I'll be enough. We'll look into it more, and you know, maybe we can come back to this. I mean, I understand the the idea of pedestrian malls and residential areas not the not really what we're talking about here in, in terms of the initiative. But uh, Mr. Huser and the city make a good point. It might create a gap, and if the you know, like the folks on Milwaukee Road in Minneapolis, they like their street uh, the, the way it is. Um, uh, so um, so with that, um, I'll anything further. I'll request a roll call and have the clerk call the roll on the A72. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Bolden? No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? No. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen? Uh, with four yeses and five noes, the A72 is not adopted. All right, members, amendments? Uh, Mr. Chair, as long as we're on that topic, I think I'd like to offer the A14. Uh, do you want to start talking about it as it comes around, Senator Jasinski? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try and make it uh, brief. Uh, again, you have some concerns over these pedestrian malls and, and uh, in the size of the city. So I think it, we would, what we would like to see is they want to try this in the metro or the, the type 1 cities or class 1 cities, uh, try that, and then to do a report and, and come back with it and, and do it. Do not look at it statewide, just basically doing it in class one cities. Uh, so if there's any more detail, uh, Mr. Greenfield can go through that, but basically what we're doing is just allowing it in class one cities, uh, doing a report, and then uh, say how, that's imp or how that is doing, and uh, come back to legislature. Mr. Chair and Senator Jasinski, that's correct. Um, that's a capable uh, description of what is done um, on instructions 1.3 to 1.8. Um, the legislative report, I will note uh, on, in paragraph C, beginning on 1.27, um, discusses the that the commissioner must report on recommendations to implement pedestrian mall development in cities statewide, uh, including state or local uh, policy chains deemed necessary or desirable. And then on page two, any information in, on interest in pedestrian mall projects in cities not of the first class. And then um, expansion of the authority to develop and implement pedestrian malls to all cities statewide. Um, I, just, I just want to ask Mr. Huser a quick question about this. Um, so, so Mr. Huser, um, we know that this is an initiative of of Minneapolis, um, but we know that the uh, either the Association of uh, Metropolitan Cities or League of Minnesota Cities um, has indicated uh, support for this um, with the understanding that some of their cities not of the first class might be interested. I just wanted to get a better sense of how, how the other cities and or their representative associations are viewing an idea like this. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Steve Huser, uh, representing the city of Minneapolis. Um, so first I'll start by saying the city of Minneapolis is a member of both the League of Minnesota Cities and Metro Cities. Um, and we've uh, been very happy to have their support with this initiative this session. Um, 
as of today, like I could, I would not be able to tell the committee for sure, like which specific cities would potentially that aren't cities of the first class that would potentially be doing a project or a different look at their right of way. But the the current statute or lack of authority makes the ability to have that conversation in those cities um, pretty much prohibitive or or not worth the time. And so the feedback that I've been getting, just kind of generally from those two associations um, and some, you know, maybe. I'll call them private conversations with some other city officials from other cities is that you know they would like this option and they would like the opportunity to at least have these conversations. This legislation would be able to allow them to have those conversations. So um, today I would, I think the city of Minneapolis would be you know in partnership with our other cities. Um, we would rather have the underlying language proceed and not have this amendment uh, be adopted into the bill. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Questions for Mr. Huser, all right. So this is another same situation. I was open to it. Um, I think I'm tilting no. However, uh, I really do want to have the conversation about maybe setting forth the places, the circumstances, uh, you know, the, you know, having some some measure of, you know, I don't want to say preemption, but some level of regulation and control. I, I'm very sensitive to that uh, conversation, Senator Draczynski. So I want to continue that even if we don't necessarily, if in, in the case that we don't adopt the A14 at this point in time. So with that, I will request a roll and ask the clerk to, unless there's anything further, sorry, don't mean to preempt conversation. The clerk will take the roll on the A14. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Bolden? No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? No. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Senator McEwen? Senator Lang? Senator McEwen? Uh, with three yes votes and five no votes, the A14 is not adopted. All right, members. Amendment. Senator Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll continue on. Uh, I have the A34 amendment, please. I think we have in our packet. Maybe not. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, one that we've talked about, and thank you again for working this. I believe you think this is a friendly or considered a friendly amendment. Uh, what this does, um, uh, it adds end reasonable after the word feasible on line 101.2 to make this so that this is, occurs when it is a reasonable idea to do so. And then it deletes the language regarding red transit pavement marking mandates uh, to focus this language solely on the uh, transit signal prioritization piece of the mm -hmm. bill. All right, uh, thank you. So um, this would be the subject of Senator Morrison's um, proposal. And Senator Morrison is with us remotely. Um, so I'll give Senator Morrison an opportunity to respond, to engross the amendment, and then respond to the idea. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Morrison. Mr. Chair, I apologize. Uh, could the amendment be re repeated, please? Uh, I'll have Mr. Greenfield. Uh. Mr. Chair and members and Senator Morrison, um, the amendment begins uh, for the A-17 on page 101. Oh, the A-34, I apologize. Uh, on 101, line 19, delete everything after priority, and page 101, line 20, delete the first, and after where, insert reasonable and. I believe this provision, Mr. Chair, applies to Senator, your, yeah, your bill, Senator File 4267, not Senator Morrison's 5099. Right, right, right. Sorry about that. <laughs> Too many amendments. Um, so, yeah, so um, members, I would, I would uh, uh, yeah, this has to do with the um, full scoping of uh, what we call full scoping of, of transit projects. Um, and uh, so that's where we're asking um, uh, as a as a function of 
particularly bus rapid transit, um, which is slated to be um, built you know, with resources that come from the Metropolitan Council. Uh, and um, there was concern expressed about um, all the elements that then uh, are forced uh, to be picked up by um, local units of government. Um, and so the conversation is about uh, you know, who should be bearing what costs when, when bus rapid transit comes through a particular community. Um, and the concern raised was, um, as Senator Dzinski articulated, um, I, you know, I think this is, you know, in the spirit of compromise, um, I would accept this as a friendly amendment, making sure that we're, we're not uh, impacting the signal prioritization, um, the, uh, the bus lane thing, I think we can um, have more conversation about. So at this point, um, I think I would take this as a, as a friendly amendment would accept the A34. Questions, members? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would, oh. I'm going to get ahead of myself. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Senator Dzinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A20 amendment. Uh, I think this one is in our packets as well. Yes. Senator Jasinski offers the A20. And Mr. Chair, uh, while you're reading it, uh, again, this is one we've discussed uh, with some of our caucuses concerned. So what this does uh, is allow the locals to appoint their own members for the advisory committee members uh, with the Blue Line anti-displacement uh, bill. Thank you. Um, and uh, I accept this as friendly. I've spoken with uh, advocates, and uh, this just simply makes sense. Um, don't need the governor to appoint from... Uh, elected bodies they're capable of appointing their own. There's a, a lar another discussion around um, uh, whether it should just be uh, majority party legislators who appoint the community members because in state and local, as Senator Jaskowski pointed out, maybe the majority is going to change someday and do we want... The, the, so we're going to have more conversation about making sure there's ongoing balance uh, in, in how community members find their way to this board. Um, but with that, the A20 is, a, is just a good government common sense amendment. So all in, any further questions? Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a technical question. I'm not necessarily opposed, but um, if we remove the language appointed by the governor, so it just says, you know, two elected or appointed officials representing the cities, who then will appoint those people? Does that need to be stated? Is it a given, like, who... We'll right. them. As I understand, well, I'll let Mr. Greenfield answer. As I understand, those bodies just um, would, you know, look to themselves to make that appointment. Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chair and Senator Bolden, I believe that's the case. Uh, I also believe there's a provision in there that says that appointments to the board are made pursuant to the open appointment process. Um, but I think that might also need to be clarified further given this, this deleting uh, of the amendment. So that clarifying... So I think to answer Senator Bolden's question, the uh, entities themselves would nominate the representatives to the board um, for purposes of the, the elected rep representatives from the cities along the Blue Line Transit Extension Project, but the, there needs to be an additional conforming change to remove the reference to the open appointment law, of which um, those appointments would be made by the governor pursuant to that relevant oh, statute of law. Point. So that right. will need to be cleaned up at some juncture. All right, thank you. Thank Senator you. Bolden. All right, thank you. All right, all in favor of the A20, say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Amendments, members. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Following along those lines and trying to uh, step a, a bit further, uh, when we had the discussion, and this one is the one that replies more or concerns, go, goes back uh, more to Senator Draskowski's comments, uh, so I'd like to offer the A21 amendment. I believe that one needs to be distributed. Oh, okay. All right. So the A21 has been distributed. All right. Um, so the A21, all right, and all right, so this is kind of how we do things normally, one from the majority, one from the minority, it's in, and et cetera. So Senator Drzezinski. Again, yes, that, what this would do is one from the majority, one from the minority, both the Senate and the House uh, would make those appointments. 
Uh, I know you had some concern over this, but I think it's just something, as Senator Draskowski pointed out, we may want to look at. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's really just opening the discussion to talk about that. Sure. Um, I'll listen to your comments, uh, and we'll go from there. So thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Senator Dzinski. Um, uh, of course, there's a lot of investment in this, uh, like both financial and, uh, and political and uh, policy investment in this. Um, uh, just thinking out loud here. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm, in, I'm inclined to, to take this, but I, I, would like, I would like the opportunity to um, have conversations, you know, now that we have sp specific language in hand with um, the proponents. Uh, I, I don't think they're in the room anymore. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, Senator Champion, who, uh, who's taken a, a real keen interest, particularly in the composition and how folks find their ways to this board. Um, I think this is ultimately where we're going to end up or something very much like this. And so at this point, um, I, I prefer the A21 not go on. Mr. Chair, with your commitment to, to discuss that, I know we've had that discussion. You have some of the same concerns we do, and you're open to that discussion. So with that, I will draw the A21. Right. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. And I, I will save this amendment and bring it to um, the proponents and, um, and to Senator Champion and Senator Rest and Senator Pod and we'll, we'll, we'll figure this piece out. Thank you. All right, amendments, members. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A27. Senator Jasinski offers the A27. Senator Jasinski, that's in our packets? Or maybe it's in my packet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Right. Chair. Again, we have the A27. Well, this is one we've discussed with you. I believe it's uh, friendly. You've uh, kind of concurred with us. So what this would do, would have the board consult with the MHFA and D, the DLI, and the Met Council for advice on where this money could have the most impact. Thank you, Senator Zizniki. I do consider the A27 friendly, and I spoke with the proponents uh, about this, and they agree this is a good idea. I would encourage a yes vote. Anything further, members? All in favor say aye. 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 Post, aye. Say no. Post say no. The A27 carries. All right, Senator Jasinski. Mr. Chair, I think this is a record day for me for a number of amendments I'm offering. Uh, Senator Howe was busy at the trooper graduation, so uh, he went to that and I went through these, so uh, I got the last update. So I would offer the A75, I believe it is. All right, uh, the A75 is making its way around to the amendment, Senator Jasinski. And Mr. Chair, with the A75, uh, this basically adds language that uh, says that none of the money may go to any of the board members, family, friends, or associates. All right. And uh, uh, again, I spoke with the advocates about um, this provision, and they agreed this was, uh, just a, uh, an, again, a good, a good housekeeping, good government piece, and I would consider the A75 a friendly amendment. Uh, questions, members? All right, all in favor of the A75 say aye. 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 Opposed aye. say no. Motion carries, A75 is adopted. All right, Senator Jasinski. Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A32 amendments. And I believe this may be friendly, but I guess I've been through so many amendments, I'm not sure this one is or not, but I, right. I believe we discussed it, and I think it may be friendly. Uh, so with that, uh, that one could be distributed. Uh, to the amendment, Senator Dzinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what this does is deletes the Met Council from being considered as a non-state source, as shown uh, via the one lines 108.5 through 108.6. All right. Um, so, yes, uh, I remember being open to this. I promised to ask the uh, advocates about it, and then I didn't ask them about it. <laughs> Um, but it is, it is the, uh, uh, the proverbial question, um, is the Met Council a state agency or is it a local unit of government? Um, and it's obviously both. There is no actual answer. We have to understand the Met Council um, from two different perspectives. And so um, do we count uh, non-state source uh, funds that come from the Met Council? Um, or not, of course, you know, we make appropriations directly to the Met Council, but then also they generate, through our authorization, uh, sales tax at the local level. So um, at this point, uh, 
Senator Zinsky, um, I think um, I'd like to either hold off on this and or um, you know, to take a vote, and I'll, I'll, I'll be a no vote, um, but we'll want to still continue to noodle through it. Hey, Mr. Chair, uh, with that, I will withdraw the A32 amendment. We'll continue to discuss uh, offline. Thank you. Okay, again, I will make the commitment to hang on to this piece of paper, do a little more thinking, a little more research, and uh, we'll, we'll resolve this. Thank you, Senator Zinsky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll continue on then with the A35 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A35. I think that one needs to be distributed as well. Uh, Maybe. No? All right. It's in our, it's in our packet. All right. Uh, thank uh, you, Mr. Senator Chair. Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm actually going to turn this one over to Council to go through this one. Uh, give, my, give me a break to get back reoriented to what the next <laughs> amendment is. Uh, Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chair and members, this is just adding some language about the reporting that the board must do as part of their um, the detailing the financial the expenditures that they may uh, utilize and approve for purposes of the anti-displacement community programming and sets forth a variety of criteria that must be provided as part of that financial review, including a detailed fiscal review of all expenditures, a correct, the criteria for determining whether a prospective expenditure of a qualifying purpose, including a detailed analysis of the decision-making process and applying the factors, a description of programs or activities funded with expenditures approved by the board, including any measurable outcomes, the source and amount of money collected and distributed by the board, which in the underlying provision that authorizes the creation of the board, it says at least 50% must come from non-state sources, so that's the intent behind that clause. An explanation of administrative expenses and staffing costs, detailed financial information of non-state funding received by the board, I guess that's the one that intended to address that issue. A detailed financial review of instances when the board required a complete independent financial audit to the extent allowed under law, and documentation of any identified misuse of expenditures or expenditures not deemed to be under the criteria of which the anti-displacement community programming is supposed to be utilized. All right, questions to the A35 members. And Mr. Chair, I think this one we discussed as well. We believe this no. was friendly, so I would that ask for a yes vote. Right. So um, I do, I, I, full disclosure, I, I I think I might have mentioned this only in the briefest of passing, if at all, to the advocates, but it's clearly a, a good housekeeping, good government piece about you know, fully understanding how these resources um, are being used, and so I would encourage a yes vote on the A35. Questions, members? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. All right. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That, that was a, quite a few uh, kind of routine amendments there. Now it's going to dive in a little bit more of uh, some substance, just definitely to me, uh, talking about the deputy registers. So I'd like to offer the A74 amendment, please. All right. A74, coming around. All right. I'm being told we may not have that one yet. All right. Um, go ahead and uh, describe it while it comes around. Uh, so uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This uh, goes back to a Senator Kroon bill. Uh, it was actually an amendment that got put on uh, initial discussions with uh, Senator Cruen. I was basically adding just a second address to send snowbirds uh, their driver's license if they may not be here in Minnesota. Uh, amendment got put on that actually allowed to renew your driver's license uh, once every other cycle. Uh, that has some concerns to me as I've made very vocal about deputy registers. Uh, it seems that we're pushing more and more business away from our deputy registers. We've talked for eight years of how valuable our de local deputy registers are, uh, so it brings me some concern if we're pushing things more and more online, uh, that these deputy registers are going to see less and less of the transactions that help them stay afloat, and it's going to be uh, puts more uh, emphasis on the very difficult transactions for them. So this is a, a, a shot at some fee sharing. Uh, what it would do would give 50% of the new online driver's license that are being renewed uh, to the deputy uh, license agents. Um, and with that, I would stand for any questions. Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, the physical copies of the A74 have not been distributed, but it is posted on the committee page um, for purposes of the committee. So I would leave it up to the chair and members whether to proceed if they don't have physical copies, but copies are being made right now. Right. Um, if we can, maybe we can uh, lay this one on the table and move to your next one. I actually would like to read it, so, all right. All right. Thank so, you, Mr. Chair. I'd ask have that one put on the table then. All right. And I would offer the A73 amendment. Right. Uh, Senator Jasinski offers the A73. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the A73 has to be distributed as well. 
as I said, I kept staff awfully busy last night. I apologize, but uh, obviously we have some concerns. We're trying to make this uh, bill uh, acceptable to our caucus. So uh, again, want to thank Senator Dibble and all our staff uh, for doing that. Uh, a lot of paperwork. I, I think like I said this is the most amount of amendments that I've done. So. Um, the A73 is being distributed. Uh, what it does is uh, we had the blackout plates were very uh, 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 found out to be very popular, uh, and it was estimated that the first 4.8 million dollars gained uh, from the blackout plates would go to DVS as projected. Uh, what this uh, amendment would do uh, would offer the money above that amount uh, go to the deputy registers to be distributed. And with that, I'd stand for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Zizinski. Um I think before I'd be ready to, to accept this, I want to understand how much, how much we're talking about. Um, I, I am, of course, always supportive of uh, figuring out um, what the, the proper uh, balance is um, um, in terms of deputy registrars, you know, assuming that we want deputy registrars to be strong and, and healthy and in place and available uh, across the state for those who need to do their vehicle transactions, and, and for those who do uh, uh, driver license types transactions, um, that they're nearby um, and they're economically viable. Um, I always struggle with um, really understanding uh, how much is needed. There are all these estimates that I never quite know what, what they're connected to, so I'm not quite ready to, to um, support the A73 at this time, um, uh, plus, uh, you know, the blackout plates have been, you know, as or even a little bit more successful than the agency anticipated, um, but then that also gives the agency the opportunity to do some of their core services that have been, uh, have been lacking. We're, of course, doing a two, you know, two plus million dollar appropriation for additional uh, examiners, which is really exciting because that, is, you know, we're, we're in a position now with a driver and vehicle services combined special revenue fund um, that's that's healthy. Um, and so I want to keep that fund healthy um, as well um, because we place a lot of demands on driver and vehicle services that carry out 10 jillion transactions and interactions with the public every year. We want them to do that as well as possible. So um, it's, it's always that, that balance. It, you know, it always seems to be a balance between DRs and DLAs and, and, the, and then the core services of the agency itself. So I appreciate the creativity. You've got a number of these creative ideas around the DRs and DLAs, um, but I'm not quite ready to support the A73 at this point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, again, I apologize. I thought that was one that we had agreed upon, and, and so I, uh, you, had, you had talked about DVS, you know, uh, having that amount that came in, but everything over and above could be used for that. So um, I guess I, right. I thought I thought different. I thought you said you weren't sure how much it was going to be. So. We weren't sure how much right. it was going to be, but we knew the 4.8 had already been going to DVS, so anything right. over and above that amount uh, would be, not be anticipated anyways, uh, so that would be a good uh, money to use. And I, I think, you know, it may be even a very small amount, but it's just something that would help our struggling deputy registers. So I'd ask for a roll call and, and um, hope that you know, I could gain your support on that one and hope members could do that. And again, think about your local deputy registers and how important they are. Um, and I have a couple more amendments, so depending on which one comes on, which comes off, or what, what doesn't get approved, then we'll see how we want to proceed after that. But I'd ask right. for your support. Thank right. you. Thank you. Anything further, members? The clerk will take the roll on the A73. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Bolden? No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? Uh, pass. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen. Senator Herr. No.
And with four yes votes and five no votes, the A73 is not adopted. Um, should we go back to the, what was it? A74. A74. Oh, A78. Okay. okay. All right. So we'll go back to the A74. Mr. Chair, I'd ask the A74 be taken off the table. The A74 is taken off the table. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you. And again, what this does is it, it splits the uh, the new additional ones that uh, Senator Kroon's bill addresses on the uh, every other year you could renew uh, from an online uh, driver's license. Uh, this would be a fee split. So 50% would go to DVS and 50% would go to the DLAs. Um, again, I, as I've mentioned many, many times before, I think it's the utmost importance to keep our local uh, deputy license agencies and uh, deputy registers uh, in our local area so that we can uh, provide a great service to them. Uh, this is one thing we've talked about. It's a very simple thing. Uh, and if we could split those fees uh, to go to both, it would help our deputy registers tremendously. Um, and I would ask for your support. I think we talked about this one. We thought it would be considered friendly. Um, so I'm going to continue to try and uh, uh, gain your support for this and uh, hope uh, that you will vote in favor. All right. Thank you. Um, I think I indicated I was... This one I actually... I don't think I indicated I was friendly to. It's the, the fee sharing conversation that's been around for, for a long time. Um, Senator Herr has a, has a response or wants to be recognized. Senator Herr. Mr. Chair and Senator uh, Jasinski, I just want to find out does it have a regional restriction or is it across the board, uh, including both rural and metro and the entire state? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a staff group. I believe it's, it's uh, across the state and metro, so it would be both areas. Anyone renewing online would go to their local DLAs, uh, either in the metro or rural Minnesota. It would be a 50-50 split, but with that, I ask Mr. Greenfield to confirm with that. Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chair and Senator Jasinski and Senator Herr, that's correct. It is a statewide assessment of the fee. and No regional distinction are made between um, metro deputy red, uh, driver's license agents and uh, outstate driver's license agents. Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, I. Oh, Senator Her, I think you muted yourself. There you go. This amendment, um, uh, I'll, I'll wait till you know the formal casting vote. Um, sound fair to me? Uh, I have a register now in my district, and so this will make last sense. Uh, and and and. Supporting it to uh, at the get go so that it could it could thrive uh, during this uh, struggling time for DV, DMV. All right, thank you. Anything further, members, on the A seventy four? All right, uh, Mr. Chair, again, I want to clarify. You did did not mention that you confirmed that was be friendly. That you had some concerns, but you were open to it. So I just want right. to confirm right. that you did not. Uh, I didn't give any misinformation. So thank you. Thank you. Or, or did you? I do. I do see one coming up that I am friendly towards. Um, all right. So with the uh, with that, um, uh, the clerk will take the roll. I'll request roll call, and the clerk will take the roll on the A seventy four. Chair Dibble, no. Vice Chair Morrison, no. Senator Jasinski, aye. Senator Bolden, no. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? Aye. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen? And with five yes votes and four no votes, the A74 is adopted. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. 
Uh, one more, I'm going to continue on working for my deputy registers and, and deputy or driver's license agents. Uh, this is one we've discussed before as well. Uh, many, many times someone will go online, uh, they'll try and get their uh, uh, transaction completed, but for some reason something goes wrong. Uh, then they then go to their local deputy registers because they can just write, drive right down the block or right in town and they have to have their local deputy register can, uh, can, uh, make the transaction complete. Again, this is the issue I have is, you know, things online. Uh, it's just nice to have someone there that can do that. So what this would do uh, is it would actually uh, give them a fee for the work. And I believe uh, with the new FAST uh, software, they can track that. And uh, what it would ask, I believe, in the uh, uh, A, I guess I don't know the amendment number. Sorry. It was ahead of myself there. So which amendment is this? The A78 Please. amendment. Thank you. So with that, I'd ask uh, council to present the A78 uh, amendment. I believe that would give them a, a $25 fee for every time they have to correct something that DVS cannot uh, complete online. And I hope that would be considered friendly to you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mr. Greenfield. Or uh, Ms. Boyd. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, there are two sections in this amendment. Uh, new language first is on 212 and this is related to a filing fee assessed by uh, collected by a deputy registrar um, and uh, um, um, the it directs the commissioner to compile data um, I believe from MinDrive of those transactions completed by registrars for which no filing fee was collected and then distribute at least quarterly those that number multiplied by $25 to the to the relevant deputy registrar um, and then there's a, a appropriate appropriation of that um, of that amount from the driver and vehicle services operating account. And analogously, on page three, there's similar language for driver's license agents. All right, thank you, Ms. Boyd. Um, so uh, I am uh, really open to this and favorably inclined towards the A78. Um, this is something we've heard about for. Some period of time, you know, I, I want to talk to the agency some more, and I don't know if they want to react at this point or not. So I haven't, you know, you're welcome to jump up any time on any of these, by the way, um, if you, if you know, as we're working through these, or if you want to give us any response to anything that we've already been through. Um, but this is the uh, the issue that we hear about a lot, of course, from um, DRs, DLAs, um, full service providers that uh, Senator Drzinski uh, very aptly articulated. Um, sometimes people run into trouble when they're trying to do an online transaction. They bring it down um, to their local office who sorts it out, but then they don't get reimbursed for any of that effort, and this would uh, remedy that circumstance. Director Zhang. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division, and DVS remains in, uh, in uh, support of, of making sure that DRs are getting paid for the work that they do. Uh, we do think that conceptually this, this gets us to where, I think closer to where we, we were, were for a, pro a solution that makes sense. We'll need to do some more analysis on kind of the number of transactions, how we actually do that, how we, how we can actually count the transactions, and also um, the, the fee included so that we can make sure the health of the account is considered. Um, um, but I do think that tracking transactions and interactions from DRs and DLAs who are supporting Minnesotans makes sense for, for um, the future ecosystem. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, sounds like there's agreement here. <laughs> Thank so you. Maybe we don't need a roll call. Um, we'll, we'll take a shot. All in favor of the A... Anything further, members? All in favor of the A78, say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, is Mr. that it for this? Mr. Chair, I think I'm going to offer a few now if that's okay. All right. If you could uh, hold, we're going to take a five-minute break. All right. Thanks. So we are in recess uh, for five minutes.
All right, we'll call the Senate uh, Transportation Committee meeting back to order. All right, now that we uh, have uh, refreshed, we're ready to roll straight through to midnight. <laughs> Joking. We're actually making pretty good time, so uh, should be out of here at a relatively reasonable hour, I hope. All right, so continuing on. We were on a roll. How did flow going, Senator Jasinski? Oh, Senator Howe, that's right. You were next. We're, we're going to give uh, Senator Jasinski a, a, a break here for a, a little bit. And uh, Mr. Chair, I'd offer the A39 amendment. Senator Howe offers the A39, which is in front of and, us. And basically, Mr. Chair, this just moves the effective date uh, from the October 2024 to January 1, 2025 for the uh, online licensing, just to kind of make it simple for DVS. So that's all the amendment does. And right. I believe that this has been discussed. All right. Um, I will, uh, I don't remember it, but that doesn't mean it wasn't discussed with me. <laughs> uh, I don't know if the agency had a response. Um, does this help matters? All right, we have a thumbs up. All right, uh, questions, members, on the A39? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. <laughs> Senator and, Howie, here you go. Yes, can, Mr. Right. Chair, uh, uh, I wanted to offer the A76 amendment. Senator Howe offers the A76, which is coming around. Go ahead and describe it while it comes around, Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And the A76 amendment, what that does is uh, basically exempts the uh, commercial driver's license uh, from the uh, prohibition from not uh, scheduling or reserving reoccurring time. Uh, so the commissioner would still be prohibited from scheduling or reserving reoccurring time for Class D, but it would not prohibit that for commercial driver's license. We're, we're short commercial driver's license in the state. Uh, this would help us get those uh, CDLs uh, done and out there for, uh, to help our, help our economy continue to go. All right, so uh, to the A76, uh, Questions, members, uh, would definitely uh, would like the response of the agency on this. Um. Yeah. Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, the DVS has concerns about this amendment and that it, it could create an inequitable um, environment for all CDL uh, appointments. Um, right now, CDL appointments are released 30 days at a time. It's available to both CDL schools and individuals who are looking to, uh, to uh, book their own appointments. Uh, we realize that we, we want to provide more appointments and make sure that we can meet the demand for Minnesotans. Um, and that's something that we continue to work on and prioritize, uh, making sure we move our resources where, where, when we can over to this space. Um, but we believe that, uh, that holding appointments is, is a is a concerning practice, and it was one that was previously barred. All right, thank you. Senator Howe. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, if you can, uh, Senator Zhang, or excuse me, I demoted you, uh, <laughs> Director Zhang, uh, is, it, is it that you're worried about having scheduled and or having drivers uh, some of these driving schools lock up some, or is there a way to, that we can work on language that would uh, allow some of that reserve time for when they actually have a student online that they can call up and lock those positions in? Director Jean. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Howe, uh, I, I think the concern is that we want to make sure the appointments are available to all um, and equitably. I, holding an appointment, um, um, just the practice of that is going to restrict others from, from getting to that appointment. 
Um, different schools have different sizes as well, and so that's another concern is how, how would we equitably assign out reserve time for, for appointments. Uh, we believe that open access to the appointments for all is the most equitable approach to, to getting appointments. Senator Howe. All right, uh, any further questions, members? Um, Could we uh, hear from uh, maybe the trucking industry? Sure. Absolutely. Mr. Estenson. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members, Jeremy Estenson with the Taft Law Firm representing the Minnesota Trucking Association. Uh, we appreciate the comments uh, Director Zhang made. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Howe, for bringing the amendment forward. Thank you, Senator Jasinski, for carrying it in a bill. Um, our concern is that, um, and we appreciate the work that DPS does, and we understand the constraints, but to be clear, there, there's an equitably uh, even chance that you won't get a test for about two months. And um, we understand the challenges, fiscal and otherwise. Um, I would imagine DPS, uh, just like the trucking industry, is having a hard time finding people to fill the positions to test and so on and so forth. Um, we're about 4,000 truck drivers short in the state of Minnesota right now. Uh, and for an average CDL student going through a program, you're about 35 years old. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a mortgage and other things, but it does set you apart slightly differently than someone going through a, a four-year program uh, at a younger age in terms of uh, financial and family responsibilities. So that two-month uh, average, two-month gap is very concerning. Uh, and frankly, Mr. Chair, members, we're trying to be creative and work with the resources that the state currently has. We look forward to working with Director Zhang to figure out how to um, make more appointments in general available. But in the meantime, we would ask you to support the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Restenson. Um, so, uh, members, uh, I'm, I'm not at this point in favor of the A76. Um, as you um, have seen, we um, have, uh, if it's successful, um, we will be having a, a larger convening uh, to talk all things CDL, um, this issue that we keep hearing about, which is uh, testing, although we do hear about testing, on the, you know, the passenger uh, license side, too. Um, this you know, may have some implications for that, and so we don't want to do something that makes that circumstance worse. We get a lot of phone calls on that subject, of course. Um, and uh, you know, there's just a lot of competing claims about where the real bottleneck is in terms of producing uh, CDLs, people who hold CDLs to fill jobs, et cetera. Um, and the idea behind that initiative, of course, is to sort through this part of the conversation, the training part of the conversation, the workforce and employment part of the conversation um, as well. And, uh, and we have uh, four different agencies tasked with and, and uh, commissioned uh, to talk with each other as well as pull in the Trucking Association and, and a whole bunch of other knowledgeable stakeholders um, to have that conversation. And this may come back to us as, as one of the recommendations. Um, I, you know, this, this may be part of the bottleneck problem. Um, it may not be. I think there's some evidence that there's other things we absolutely need to grapple with and you know, we may not solve our problem by doing this and we may have an unintended consequence from the 876. Mm -hmm. Senator well, Mr. Howell. Chair, Mr. Chair, if you're gonna, uh, if we're gonna have further conversation and actually work to resolve this, I'll withdraw the A76. Right. I appreciate that, Senator Howell. Senator Howell withdraws the A76. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll offer the A26. Senator Howe offers the A26. I believe that's it's in our packet. In the packet, yes. To and the A26, Senator And I Howell. believe this is, I think, from my indication that uh, I think this is acceptable. What this basically does is it's kind of a technical piece, but it adds, uh, it, it adds on line, uh, Page 20, page 20, or line 22, it, add, it, uh, it adds add or before. So actually it it's a, puts all that multimodal into, uh, into the calculation also. So all and right. that's in this, uh, well, you know, in all the right. greenhouse so emissions assessment. Right, so this has to do with the uh, Senator Morrison proposal on uh, you know, taking a look at the uh, impact on uh, greenhouse gas emissions from our um, 
transportation sector. Um, I believe this actually picks up some language that was um, offered to you on the other it. side. Um, but uh, with that, I will um, defer to Senator Morrison for her response to the A26. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator How I do view this as a friendly amendment, so I would um, urge a yes. All right. Anything further on the A26 members? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. And we'll keep on going with the uh, end of that realm, and we'll uh, offer the A36 amendment. Senator Howe offers the A36. Uh, not sure if this is a friendly amendment or not. Uh, you'll have to help me with that. But uh, basically it allows EVs and other zero emission vehicles adoptions, including EV charging and zero emission transit bus procurement to be included as well. Uh, this is also something that was uh, uh, adopted by the other body, which really has no impact on us anyway. So, <laughs> so I will um, again. Uh, so, what I believe the effect it has, and you know, maybe Mr. Greenfield can confirm for the purpose of counting offsets, um, uh, uh, the adoption um, of accelerated electric vehicle and other zero emission vehicle adoption, uh, et cetera, could be counted uh, towards uh, the offsetting. Um, Mr. Greenfield, are you able to help expand our understanding of the A36? Thanks. Mr. Chair, members, that's correct. Um, there's an enumerated list of offsets and mitigation actions that the department is required to take if the project or portfolio is assessed to require that action. And this just adds, as Senator Howe and Chair Dibble confirmed, uh, accelerated EV and zero emission vehicle adoption as part of those mitigation and offset activities. Yeah, I'm, I'm not certain this was picked up uh, across the street, um, but I will nevertheless defer to Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Howe. You know, we do have the advisory council, um, and I think we should probably defer to the experts on this, and so I would um, ask for a no vote on this amendment. All right, thank you. Anything further on the A36, Senator Jasinski? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, I, you know, it brings up the subject of LP, uh, for buses as well, and it could have been addressed in the other bill, but it's this one as well. And I, I know an LP is a low emission, but not a zero emission. But uh, I think we should look at the, the having the definition uh, to include LP, because again, that's transitioning towards something. It could be an intermediary before we get to the full zero. But I think we should definitely have the discussion about LP uh, buses about being included uh, somehow t uh, to you know get get us to that point at some point. That's right, we were gonna yeah, bring that up in the uh, zero emission vehicle um, initiative conversation. So thank you for, for raising that. So, you know, the, the proverbial bridging technology that might help with some of the um, soft landing um, uh, kind of off-ramp uh, efforts that we have in, in that policy initiative. Um, so uh, back to the A36. Um, uh, Anything further, members? Um, I'll request a roll call and ask the clerk to take a roll on the A36. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Bolden? No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Her? No. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen? A40, and uh, I believe that's in the packet. Senator Howe offers the A40. And uh, what this would do would, uh, from this uh, Senator Morrison's bill, would it would exempt safety-related projects. Uh, so that's what it would, uh, it would allow some of those projects that are out there that need 
to be done for safety reasons to be exempt from this these provisions all right so and I believe this is you've had this discussion so yes uh, I, I signaled an openness to it but also a, a wish to understand better Senator Morrison's perspective on the on the matter so Senator Morrison for the 40 uh, thank you mr. chair and thank you senator Howe. I appreciate the intent of this amendment um, but I think we have to be taking a comprehensive look at this, and I, I think we can do both. Uh, MnDOT has a lot of tools to address safety, and I think going forward, we need to be always keeping greenhouse gas emissions in mind. Uh, so I, I would ask for a no vote on this amendment. All right. Anything further? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is one that has been my concerns for a while with this bill. I've made it pretty vocal about that. Again, you're looking back at uh, Highway 14 and some of these things that, uh, you know, you really need to look at safety. I've been at so many funerals uh, down on Highway 14 before we got the new 14 built. Uh, and, I, and I think we definitely have to look at safety as part of this. And that's my concern that we're going to overlook safety for emissions. And, and I just don't think that's right. Uh, we all want to have zero emissions at some point. But I think we need to give priority to safety, and, and that's my big concern. Uh, again, going to a funerals down there and seeing, you know, the lives lost, and I think we need to keep safety as our number one uh, issue. And I, and I don't want to put that against emissions. And, and I really think that if we overlook safety, it's going to be a huge mistake. And so, I'd ask for your support and think of the safety of our citizens of Minnesota. Mr. Chair, Senator Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I just want to uh, agree with Senator Jasinski that safety has to be preeminent, but I, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Safety has to be in the forefront, as do greenhouse gas emission reductions. We can do both. All right. Thank you, Senator Morrison. <clears throat> I also uh, want to reiterate uh, commitments I've made and public statements I've made from this chair that um, we don't want to negatively impact um, those projects that are focused on safety. This is about um, additional, uh, you know, finding, finding ways to either offset uh, induced additional uh, VMT or, um, you know, just trying to get a handle on, on uh, the carbon contribution, the greenhouse gas contribution from the transportation sector and in no way impacting or negatively affecting needed safety improvements, which we acknowledge we need all over the state. Um, and so I will commit to continuing to try to try to drill down on this and try to figure out how we make that really clear in this policy, even if we don't adopt the A40. So with that, um, anything further, members, on the A40? Um, I'll request a roll call and have the clerk call the roll. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Yes. Senator Bolden? No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Yes. Senator Herr? No. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator Lane, can you repeat your vote? Aye. Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen? With four yes votes and five no votes, the A40 is not adopted. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, with that, I, I think with uh, that understanding and with the understanding this one has been discussed and agreed to, I'll offer the A68 amendment. Senator Howe offers the A68 68 and, amendment. And this, uh, I'll describe it as they're passing out. This basically is kind of the walk in that line that if MnDOT sees that it's needed for public safety reasons, then they could exempt a specific project due to safety concerns, but then they need to report to the legislature why. All right. 
Um, so um, similar theme to the, the previous, um, allowing MnDOT to exempt a project and then, uh, and then justify and rationalize uh, why they have done so. Um, I will defer to Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Howe. I, I, again, I appreciate um, the intent of this. I'm a little concerned about the um, just sort of the vagueness of the uh, some of the wording reasonably addresses. I'm willing to continue um, working on this, but for now, um, having not had a conversation with you about it yet, Senator Howe, I would I would ask for a no vote on this, um, but obviously there is still time to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? Senator Dzinski. Uh, Mr. Chair, again, I guess I'm a little disappointed. Again, this is something we've been working uh, with you and uh, I guess I haven't been direct contact with Senator Morrison, but again, this is going back to a safety issue as I brought up before, and this is actually giving MnDOT uh, the authority. If they actually see something, that they can bring it forward. Uh, you know, this is basically, uh, MnDOT is run by the administration. If they see there's some glaring thing as a public safety issue, they should be able to come forward and exempt a, a project. Um, it's not exempting all safety-related projects. It's, it's a specific one that MnDOT would have that concern that they could exempt that. Um, so, you know, I would ask for your vote. I, I thought we were friendly on this one. And, and I just look at the whole, uh, as Senator Morrison's whole bill, I understand what we're trying to do to eliminate greenhouse gases, but we're putting that and, ve and vehicle miles traveled against each other. And, uh, you know, and maybe in the, in the metro versus rural Minnesota is different, but I think if we have a thriving economy in Minnesota, uh, I talked to, uh, you know, uh, the chamber and tour Minnesota and those things, we want people to be traveling. We want them to be going camping. We want them to be going up north. We want them to be going boating. We want travel in rural Minnesota. And you're putting vehicle miles traveled against emissions. And again, I think it's a little different in, in the suburban areas, but uh, if we want Minnesota to be thriving, uh, we want to see people traveling in Minnesota. We want them to be going up north. We want them to be going to Valley Fair. We want them to be going down to these different uh, things across the state. So this overall bill, I think, puts this attitude against uh, vehicles traveling. And we're going towards green, we're, we're doing electric cars, we're uh, eliminating uh, uh, other issues, some of the you know pollution things and like that, but I think we're really putting vehicle miles traveled uh, weighted too much in this. And, and it's part of this, not directly to this amendment, but it's part of it. And again, I, I think we're, we're doing a disservice. Uh, again, we all want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but we're, you know, and, and I, maybe someone from the chamber could come and, and make a comment on this, but I, I think we're, we're trying to discourage people to travel in, in Minnesota, and that's not what we should be doing. People want to go safely. Uh, they want to get to their destination. They want to tour a uh, tourism issue in Minnesota. Uh, we have 10,000 lakes that we'd love for people to come, other states to travel, to, to view our small little mom and pop resorts. And this, this is my big concern with this uh, bill, uh, that, that that's, we're not taking that into consideration. So if, if someone's here from the chamber or deed or someone, uh, if we could talk about the importance, and again, when, when Minnesota has a thriving economy, this is something we want. So if someone's here, that would be great. Well, I would welcome anyone to come to the table at Senator Drzezinski's invitation. Um, I don't know if the Department of Transportation had any response. Oh, thank you. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, thank you for the, uh, uh, the question and the invitation to Senator Jasinski. Um, and Bentley Graves from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Um, when it comes to transportation policy, you know, our efforts are always centered around uh, making sure that Minnesota has a safe, reliable, multimodal, and efficient transportation system. And that is, first and foremost, uh, to serve the interests of our members in moving uh, goods uh, and fueling our economy. But certainly, to, to your point, Senator Jasinski, uh, you know, we want to make sure that our state is accessible not just to Minnesotans, uh, but to those who would want to come here and explore it and, and see all that it has to offer. Um, and uh, I guess from, from that standpoint, we want to be you know, a, a constructive partner in any conversation this committee has, that the legislature has about how to do that. And again, with, with a goal in mind of maintaining a safe, efficient, reliable, multimodal transportation system. Um, and uh, uh, so maybe I, I guess I'd leave it at that. If there's a specific question, I'd be happy to answer it. But, but again, appreciate the opportunity to come down and, and offer that, that input. All right. Thank you. Mr. Rudine. 
thank you, Mr. Chair. Eric Redeem, Indoc Government Affairs. And I, I would just echo the comments of Senator Morrison that uh, the department thinks we really can do both. We can, we can um, ensure that our, our system is safe while addressing uh, the GHG and VMT goals that we've established. And uh, I think we would also share some of the concerns about um, terms like urgent traffic safety response and, and reasonably addresses traffic safety without some sort of parameters around that. I think the department would be uh, perhaps under pressure by, by you know, proponents of projects to, to deem their, their proposal to, to meet those criteria, but we wouldn't really have anything objective that we could evaluate that against. Thank you. Anything further, members? Uh, Senator Howe. Well, Mr. Chair, I, I do believe that if you've got a, a, a traffic death count at a certain intersection and a, a, or a certain, uh, I, I, or a certain uh, section of road, I think that is the data that you need when, it's, when you classify urgent. Uh, but with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I, yeah, I'll just leave a go at that, and I'm just disappointed. All right, and I just wanted to say, um, uh, just to respond a little bit to Senator Dzinski, um, uh, I agree completely with everything you've said, and I actually agree with the, the spirit of, of the A68, um, and I believe strongly, I mean, couldn't believe more strongly in wanting people uh, to be able to get uh, where they want to go for goods and services to get to market. Um, I believe there are ways that um, we can fully synthesize uh, a number of decisions that we make uh, in, in tandem with um, how our roadway system uh, supports all of that uh, in, in ways that support the goals that Senator Morrison has set forth. And there are ways to do it that, uh, that drive us in the, in the opposite direction, no pun intended. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are ways to design communities and, and, uh, and improve our roads um, that actually enhance mobility uh, and, and also support all the communities we're trying to support, the economy we're trying to support, the environment that we're trying to support, that is, that is different if we're not reaching into the same toolbox over and over again. Completely agree that the, that the safety improvements um, are important, um, you know, and I will commit to continuing to work on this language so that, so that we, that is crystal clear for anyone who's taking a look at this basket of policies that that we're, we're, we're not trying to preempt uh, safety and the ability to, to do safety improvements. We're trying to drive a more robust conversation. Um, MnDOT working with local land use authorities, working with uh, transit authorities, working with uh, you know, the local communities to, to really build out a system that um, actually creates a more efficient transportation system. We probably get more mobility for, less, for fewer dollars. Um, if this is really fulfilled the way Senator Morrison envisions. Senator Jasinski. Looks like uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I think that happens in the suburban areas, but I think metro or rural Minnesota is different. And, and I think we have to look at the whole state and, and some of the things you described, I think, in, in the metro do. You, you have other forms of transportation. You have light rail, you have bus rapid transit. You have all those things. But in rural Minnesota, we have limited other ways of transportation. So uh, to limit the vehicle miles traveled uh, really has a detrimental effect on rural Minnesota versus the metro. Because the metro, like I said, has many other options. And, and I'll let this go at one point, but my, I guess my question may be to MnDOT. Is there any of our neighboring states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, does anybody else have something like this? that uh, address that, because again, when you look at uh, greenhouse gas emissions and global warming, uh, you have to look at the whole region, I think. So I, I guess I'm asking, do our neighboring states have anything, uh, and again, I know we're on the amendment, but it's, I just, before I forget about it in the end of the bill, but is there any other states that have this type of restrictions on what's going on in their transportation system? Mr. Rudy. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Jasinski, uh, I'm not aware of neighboring states directly neighboring, but uh, the legislation is really based on uh, a provision that Colorado enacted. So uh, to my knowledge, they were kind of the first uh, in the nation to, uh, to, to implement requirements to do an analysis of, of what you know, impact projects have on greenhouse gas emissions and then uh, if a project is, is determined to increase GHG emissions, then there needs to be some mitigation. So uh, last year's legislation was, was largely modeled on, on what had been enacted in Colorado. 
Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And my Mr. final Mr. comment again, we're just putting Minnesota at a disadvantage to our neighboring states. Uh, we're going to have uh, roads are going to cost more money. They're going to take longer to get approved. Uh, it, we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage to our neighboring states uh, for tourism, for uh, development, for uh, tax base, uh, you name it. Uh, we're actually putting Minnesota at a disadvantage to our neighboring states. And, and I, I know people may not agree with me, but I know there's many people that do agree with me. Uh, this is going to increase the cost of our roads. Uh, it's going to increase the time to get them approved. And uh, it's going to cost more of our citizens, citizens more money, uh, no matter how you go, from transportation that relates down to the bread you serve at your table. It's all going to cost more money uh, because of this. So it's my concern. If, if our, none of our neighboring states are doing it, uh, I think you have to look at the regional effects. So my last comment, and then we'll move on. Sorry. Great. Thank you. Anything further on the A68? Um, I'll request a roll call. Clerk will take the roll. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Bolden? No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? Nay. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen? Uh, with four yes votes and five no votes, the A68 is not adopted. Senator Howe? Well, Mr. Chair, I was going to offer the A43, but uh, I don't believe we've got a green light from Senator Morrison, so uh, I will not offer the A43, and uh, we can, uh, I think Senator Jasinski will offer the next amendment. All right. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll move on to the lights on section, uh, so I'd like to offer the A61 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A61? Correct. All right. Very good. I don't here. know if we have that one in our package. We do. In our packets, okay. yeah. My desk has become a mess here, so I'll have to try and get it organized again. I keep throwing uh, my stuff back here. Uh, Mr. Chair, the A61, it's, I believe it's friendly. It just clarifies uh, and lights on and that the locals are not using this money for administration costs. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Um, yes, I think this would be consistent with the, uh, the program as presented to us by um, former Commissioner Harrington. Uh, any questions on the A61? All right. Um, and I would consider it friendly. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Senator Jasinski. Mr. Chair, I'd offer the A60 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A60. Which is in our packet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this uh, basically on line 54, I uh, would delete the word purpose in the, in the purpose statement. So, uh, yeah, members, it's kind of a Senate thing, purpose statements. We'll probably get deleted along the way anyways, somewhere along here. So um, uh, uh, I, would, I would support a deletion of the purpose statement. I do think uh, for those who are concerned about uh, losing uh, some of those uh, sentiments, we do have um, some language coming that strengthens the actual purpose um, and focuses it on, so, so the, the law itself, um, of course, makes clear the purpose. Um, so I uh, find that friendly. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A64 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A64. Looks like it's coming around. That one I think we don't have. All right. Um, yes, please describe the amendment as it comes around, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so what this does is make sure the light's on and the locals have to give necessary information to the commissioner. Uh, B, it has uh, have to show, uh, shown by which local departments have given out these vouchers. Uh, it has it shown which auto body shops were receiving and how many vouchers. Uh, I believe we discussed this. Uh, this is something that I think is good government just to see uh, what's going on with this money and making sure where it's going and how it's being used. And I would ask for a, a green vote. All right. Yes, I, I think uh, I would concur. Senator Jasinski, it's a house, good housekeeping, um, good government. Make sure we know 
how these numbers are being dispersed, how these dollars are being dispersed, how these vouchers are being used. Um, I would support the A64. All in favor, oh, anything further? Any questions, members? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A66. Senator Jasinski offers the A66. And I think this one might be in the packet. Uh, and what it does is it, it has preference of being given to the areas with the higher amounts of uh, accidents and tickets uh, given for broken headlights and I would assume taillights. So yeah, I don't see it. Don't we need to make copies on that one. So Mr. Okay. Shad asked to put the A66 on the table. The A66 is on the table. It's laid on the table. Okay, Senator Jasinski. I have the A63 amendment. Is that one there? A63, we have a copy. So the A63 will be passed out and go ahead and describe it. And this uh, makes it so that the vehicle can only be given one voucher per time amount on the time so that someone doesn't keep getting pulled over and keep getting vouchers. Another good governance bill. All right. Um, yes, I think this, uh, this makes a lot of sense. I would, uh, I would support the A63. Um, any questions, members, on the A63? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Mr. Chair, I would offer the A62 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A62 amendment coming around as we speak. And go ahead and describe it while it comes around, Senator Thank you. This uh, clarifies that the vehicle plate, badge number, and the date issued must be on all of the vouchers given out. Thank you, uh, Senator Jasinski. Um, I believe um, that is... Uh, the current practice and just 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 make sure that that uh, continues on um, as is it, the current practice continues to be followed in perpetuity so it makes sense I support the a62 any questions members all in favor say aye aye opposed say no a62 carries senator Jasinski actually mr. chair I'm, if I can offer the next uh, amendment uh, we're going to go to the lane filtering amendment uh, to and offer the A51. All right. No? You got one? Thanks, sir. No, we'd like to go back to it. So stay on the subject and the other one is ready. So I believe it was the A... A66? Oh. Okay. A said I go back to you, sir. Howell. I apologize. All right. So, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the A51. Senator Howe offers the A51. And that should be in the packet. And basically what this does is it gives an additional $100,000 from the motorcycle safety account for the educational requirements uh, to make sure that uh, people understand the lane filtering process. So this would just uh, uh, add another 100000 to the educational fund for the uh, motorcycle lane filter in peace. All right. Thank you, Senator Howe. Uh, questions, members, on the A51? Um, I'll just note, um, is, uh, uh, so you know, obviously uh, it, the, the position re remains in the bill, um, so it would be important to, to educate folks. Um, however, we do have information that the, the motor safety account, motorcycle safety account, um, there is, the, the resources are, are in the account now, but uh, funding it at this level makes it non-sustainable. So I think it's fine to, uh, to adopt this amendment, but we'll probably have to figure out a, a better source. Um, but, um, but for the purpose of having the conversation about, you know, making sure, you know, should, should lane splitting, lane filtering uh, remain and, and uh, be enacted into law, um, there would be definitely have to be a substantial amount of training, outreach, public engagement, et cetera, probably can't be supported out of the motorcycle safety account as, as we've come to understand, though. So anything. Anyways, anything further? Uh, any questions, members? All right. All in favor of the A51, say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. 
And Mr. Right. Ch Senator Howe. Chair, go to uh, the offer the A47 account uh, amendment. Senator Howe offers the A47. Coming around. Go ahead and describe it, Senator Howe. Basically, Mr. Chair, this uh, uh, limits that they can't use uh, trunk highway funds for the work site training program if the state funded construction project is not a highway construction project. It just limits where they can spend the money. So Senator Howe offers the A47. Uh, members, um, just to shed a little more light on this, so, so this is the governor's initiative. Um, uh, the uh, Department of Transportation happens to have uh, quite a bit of expertise in uh, tribal training and tribal um, uh, engagement, tribal interaction, and so they provide that expertise um, across the enterprise, across uh, many other state agencies. Um, uh, so I think the concern that's been raised, which I share, so I support the A47, and that um, if that this this activity um, would be great uh, in terms of uh, MnDOT's interaction with uh, other agencies and in, in doing its tribal activities on trunk, if it has to do with trunk highway construction uh, training, um, but um, you know if it's being used to to do construction training and, and tribal uh, programming outside of the trunk highway fund system, um, it shouldn't be funded with trunk highway funds. If that makes sense. All right, questions, members, to the A47. All right, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right, uh, Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd offer the A70 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A70 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. While this one's being distributed, uh, this would delete. Uh, via 54.25 of the language that uh, says have historically received under investment, uh, which is we believe is vague and is vague and extremely subjective. It also describes high poverty areas. So I believe this is a friendly amendment. So Senator, yeah, so this goes back to the lights on program. Uh, so this is a, another place where we actually fulfill the intentions of the program as was captured in the purpose statement that we just deleted. Um, and so it's a focusing of priority on, on where these uh, vouchers would be uh, given out um, that supports uh, um, the purpose and intent and priority of the program itself. I would be supportive of the A70. Questions, members, to the A70? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'd ask to take A66 off the table. So... The A66 is taken from the table. And with that, uh, this would uh, have preference would be given to areas of higher amounts of accidents and tickets uh, given for broken headlights and taillights or lighting equipment, I guess, as, as it's described. I believe this would be a friendly amendment. All right. Thank you. Also makes uh, sense. Uh, um, fulfills, I think, again, the uh, focus and, and intention of the program. Of course, I haven't been asking I've been doing this and kind of rolling right past Senator Herr. Um, I assume Senator Herr would be in favor of this as well if, if he wants to weigh in. Um, anything further on the A66? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no, motion carries. All right, Senator Drzezinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think those are more of the routine ones. This is a, another one that I've uh, been extremely interested in. I'd like to offer the A-59 amendment. Senator Dzinski offers the A-59 amendment. And Mr. Chair, I'll explain it while it's being distributed. Or may, you may have it in the packet. Uh, we've had we some discussions with small cities about having a hole, uh, basically, of not funding. Uh, and we did get some money in there, uh, but it's not uh, what they need. So this would... Uh, uh, get $10 million from the general fund, uh, to the general fund from the IIJA to uh, the small cities for fiscal year 25 uh, to help with road construction in our small cities. So uh, Senator Chesinski offers A59, um, increasing in the short term um, resources to the small cities uh, in light of the issues that Mr. O'Rourke raised um, the other day. 
Uh, questions, members from the A59? This is, does not affect our target, of course. It borrows from um, uh, the IIJA match dollars. Uh, Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, we, do. Are we still working on trying to find out where that money went because we appropriated it, and then we don't have that answer yet? I take it. Uh, Ms. Boyd. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair and Senator Howe, I can, I can walk through as, as best I understand it. Um, in the past, Small Cities has, has gotten, we set up the account quite a bit ago, um, and in the past, Small Cities has gotten appropriations from the legislature in lump sums from the general fund. Um, those amounts are transferred in pretty, you know, in one lump sum and then can be distributed, um, and the amount is known and is contained within that one year. However, the new revenue is uh, sale, or is uh, part of the auto parts sales tax and then the new retail delivery fee will be coming online. That's a sales tax that's deposited monthly, collected monthly and deposited monthly, and there's, I believe, a two-month delay on how it's reported. So when the certification has to go to DOR from MnDOT about what is going to be deposited or distributed in June, they only know up through April, so they have eight months of revenue. So in any given year in the future, what you're going to have is eight months of the prior year at a lower rate because this tax rate is increasing going to, to the TAA fund and two months at the, at the new rate. So it's a delay. It's unfortunate. And especially in the first couple of years when the revenue is smaller, it's going to be even more of a delay and look smaller than what was actually booked in the spreadsheet last year. I hope that makes sense. So, Mr. Chair, Ms. Ms. Boyd, does that mean that we're – Instead of doing it while the initial intent of that legislation that was kicked around for a few years was done on the estimation done by the automotive parts sales, uh, the national, well, they just estimated the annual amount that was spent in Minnesota. We're now actually collecting the actual tax receipts from all of that. Uh, from every tire, windshield wiper, and how are they tracking that rather than just taking, we tried to keep the administrative fees by just doing the, the taking it from the, the national deal. I take it that the legislation that was enacted did not follow that and they actually made it the actual receipts from automotive parts? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Howe, I'm not entirely sure I'm understanding your question, but um, I'll try to say it again, that I, I, I believe that the, the projected at this point is pretty close to what it was last year. So the actual amount collected per year is pretty close to what was projected at the time of enactment. However, because it's a monthly deposit and it has to be certified and distributed at a certain point in time, we don't, at that point, we don't know the actuals for that year. And then, I, I don't believe I'm, I'm, I think I need to show you sort of a spreadsheet well, to maybe explain Mr. It. Chair, and I think, uh, Senator Howe, I think the difference is, is when I wrote, originally wrote the legislation that ended up whatever, however it ended up being written, I've got to go back and look at it. But the intent was, is not to deal with actual receipts. Of tax revenue from the automotive parts, it was a, it was taken from the national automotive parts sales, that actually took an estimation because of what they distributed in Minnesota, and they took that number and applied the sales tax to it, and that's what they distributed. So apparently now instead of doing that, because we were trying to minimize the accounting and the administrative part of that to try and minimize so it was just an estimation. It sounds like now we're actually taking in the actual receipts from automotive parts and I can only imagine that every, uh, of what is all included in that and the, and the mountain of administrative that has to be done to collect that and why that would be slow. Uh, we need to relook at that if that's truly what it was, because it was really supposed to be just take go, going off the administration from what we initially had started. So I'm, I'm a little disappointed that this thing has gotten to be administrative nightmare instead of a simple estimation. 
Mr. Chair and Senator Howe, I believe uh, Mr. Knatter Tupinger from MnDOT may be a better explainer of this than me, and hopefully satisfied. Mr. Knatter Tupinger, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Josh Knatter Tupinger, MnDOT CFO. Mr. Chair, Senator Howe. So this is all a function of just a transition period. So that auto parts sales tax is still an estimate, so that process has not changed. Department of Revenue makes an estimate based on that national, our share of the national total. We get that money in monthly deposits. So the issue is we've started to receive that money in fiscal year 24. The statute for how we can distribute it in that small cities account says that we have to certify to the Department of Revenue once a year by June 1st how much that is. So for fiscal year 24, we'll know how much we have through April. Those eight months will get distributed this upcoming July and December with LGA, which is how the process has always worked for the distribution. But because it's a small dollar amount and we're only, now we're receiving cash deposits instead of a one-time transfer at the beginning of the year, it has the effect of a one-year delay for this first year. So everything about the testimony from Mr. O'Rourke in the previous days is absolutely true. No money has gone out yet from that account. The first distributions will happen in a couple months. And then going forward, it will grow significantly. So that first year amount is about two and a half million for small cities. It'll be close to 90 million in 10 years. So there's an aggressive phasing period, but it is very slow on the beginning, beginning years. Thank you. And it's complicated. All right. <laughs> so, Mr. Chair, I, I'll be looking at that next year. All right, because I, I, I think there's an easier way to make that happen. Thank you. All right, we look forward to that. All right, so uh, on the A59, bringing some more uh, resources to the small cities in the, in the near term. Um, any questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator I think we're getting towards the end. Uh, Trying to go through them as fast as we can. Uh, we have the A, I'd like to offer the A71. Senator Jasinski offers the A71. I believe Mr. Greenfield's gonna distribute the A71. All right. uh, I know we've talked about this last year. I know MnDOT doesn't like me asking this, but I'm gonna ask for a report. Uh, it adds a report from MnDOT to tell us what's happening with the cities and their speed limits. So uh, last year, uh, we allowed for uh, cities to post to a lower than recommended speeds or lower than uh, designed traffic speeds. So we'd like a report to say what's happening in our cities and how that's affecting uh, things. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I think we've talked about this one. I think you had some concerns as well. So with that, I would turn it to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Jasinski. Um, so, uh, yeah, this, I think, is responsive to... To my observation, um, might have something to do with something that happened in my family. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, I was I was the chief author of the bill that allowed cities to vary their speed limits down um, to, you know, what they deemed to be the most advisable, um, and I'm I'm a strong supporter of that. I think that needs to be done in a way, of course, that. Uh, takes into account the context in which a particular speed limit is established and um, well, you know when for example a speed limit is posted at 20 miles an hour on a on a roadway that's clearly designed um, for 35 or 40 miles per hour um, the the number on the sign isn't going to have the desired effect and it's going to create a, a lot of unintended problems um, so this uh, asks the Department of Transportation to take a look at that whole situation. Of course, we have Ann Finn here, who represents cities. We have MnDOT here. We're asking them to do another study. Um, so uh, I would support the A71, but um, you know, want to um, continue to have conversations with MnDOT and League of Minnesota Cities and, and others about um, how, to, how to carry out um, this analysis and et cetera. So, um, so I support the A71. Uh, questions uh, from the committee? about the A71. All right. Um, it, and it's actually particularly timely because, of course, uh, we're adopting the, the speed limit chapter of the Manual on Uniform Control, Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD. Um, uh, and so it's a, it's a timely moment to, to have this information in hand as well because that's a more progressive way, more uh, scientifically driven way to establish speed limits. Uh, wherever they're being established. All right, 
Uh, all in favor, uh, any questions? Anything further, members, on the A71? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right, Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A38 amendment. I believe that one's being distributed. All right. Uh, please describe it as it's coming around, Senator Jasinski. And I might turn this one over uh, to Ms. Boyd here in a second, but uh, basically this uh, changes the trunk highway uh, fund usage regarding the state road construction and uh, quarters of commerce. Uh, currently, there's $15 million for each in fiscal year 25. Uh, we'd like to make some modifications to that, and I'll let Ms. Boyd go through that if she doesn't mind. Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Boyd. Uh, uh, the amendment, the, the language currently has a $15 million one-time appropriation in 25 for state road construction and $15 million one-time for quarters of commerce. This amendment would change... Um, I'm trying to track the numbers. Would change the 25 appropriation for um, state road construction to $20 million, and then the base would be $10 million in 26, $10 million in 27, and zero thereafter. So it would be a three year increase for state road construction of 20, 10, and 10. Um, and that's, that's not above the 15, that's 20 instead of 15 and 25. Mm -hmm. And for quarters of commerce, what the amendment would do would change the 15 in fiscal year 25 to a $5 million appropriation, and then the base would be $10 million in fiscal year 26 and $60 million in fiscal year 27, and then that would be ongoing on the base on top of the current appropriation would be $60 million additional. And this is all from the Trunk Highway Fund. Um, thank you. Um, uh, so, you know, the... To the to the committee, I'll just say you know the 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 dollars that we put in from Trunk Highway Fund, you know of course are cash, you know so they're obviously much smaller dollars than we're accustomed to talking about because usually we're authorizing a, a a bonding program that's in the hundreds of millions because you know roughly speaking you know ten, one dollar to every ten um, supports um, bonding um, and we would have the ability if we weren't constrained by the overall state limitation on bonding. Um, to, to authorize a bonding program uh, in the neighborhood of 600 million or so, but we are constrained because I think the bonding bill itself um, is gonna use up to the maximum allowable in geo bonding, which kind of knocks us out. So, so we're, relatively speaking, uh, even though we're talking about what most normal people would think of as a lot of money, this relative to the transportation program is not a lot of money. So. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm wide open, you know, to to changing this, adding to the base, et cetera. Um, you know, what I brought in in terms of the the chair's mark um, was just a starting point for that conversation. I'm comfortable with making um, this change. I do know, uh, Senator Jasinski, um, we had talked about um, the Department of Transportation wanting assurance that they wouldn't have to do uh, a new round of quarters of commerce selection. Um, is that in this amendment or is this, uh, is that? Uh, is Thank that you, Mr. Chair, for bringing that up. Yes, I don't know, it's not in here, but if we could do an oral amend amendment, maybe Mr. Greenfield uh, would know how to state that, but yes, so they wouldn't have to do a new report, that would be great. Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chair and members, could you repeat the oral amendment? I'm sorry, I don't have the amendment in front of me. Uh, it would just clarify that MnDOT does not have to do a selection process until fiscal year 27, uh, unless additional funding is given. I might, for, for quarters of commerce. Mr. Chair, I might turn this over to Ms. Boyd just for purposes of identifying where this should be placed. Ms. Boyd. <laughs> just start talking. Mr. Chair, I believe this would be in rider language um, in the A3. So the amendment would be um, that it would, the amendment would be page four after line two. Um, Maybe Senator Jasinski could restate the. <laughs> sure, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Boyd. So it would clarify that MnDOT does not have to do a selection process until fiscal year 27 unless additional funding is given. Uh, Mr. Chair, that would be Ms. language Boyd. inserted uh, uh, in the A3. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not making sense. Um, page four after line two, insert. 
the commissioner, I'm forgetting it again. The commissioner does not have to. Commissioner Mindot does not have to do a selection process, selection process until fiscal year 27 unless additional funding is given. Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski is serving his staff for the day, and if that could be recorded as the amendment, I'd appreciate right. it. Great. Thank you. So thanks. So, um, so we'll, we'll incorporate that into the amendment, but um, I, I do want to open it up to the committee uh, on the A38 to see if they have questions um, and or concerns or comments about the A38, kind of just changing the, the, the balance of of funding for state road construction, quarters of commerce, and then uh, adding to the base going forward in terms of trunk highway fund cash to the committee. Anything further? All in favor of the A38? Oh, oh Senator Carlson. As amended. Thank Senator. you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'm, I'm wondering uh, when we talk about unless more funding is available, do we have to take action to, to assign that funding if there's more funding available? I believe so. Yeah, Senator, yeah. Ms. Boyd. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair, maybe we could work on this amendment offline for a bit and All right. come back to this. All right. That would be helpful. If you're comfortable, we'll put the A38 yep. on the table. I'd move to push the A38, or put the A38 on the table. All right, the A38 is on the table. All right, Senator Drzezinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a much simpler one. It's the A31 amendment. Uh, we've talked with this. I think we have... Uh, uh, Peace in the Valley, um, and what it really does is just allows the deputy registers can issue replacement license plates. Uh, with that, I ask for your support. So, uh, so yeah, Senator Jasinski offers the A31. I think this is the language of a bill you introduced. Is that true? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chair. I believe it was Senate file number 5319. All right. Thank you. Um, so, if we could invite the agency to the table, help us understand the A31 and the agency's position on the A31. Mr. I correct that. That's for registered fleet, registered fleet vehicles. Welcome to the committee, Director Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, the A31 allows for deputy, would allow for deputy registrars to issue uh, duplicate plates and duplicate cap cards for fleet vehicles as well as add um, vehicles to a fleet, um, but not, cr not add a new fleet to the system. Um, this is, we've been in conversation with the deputy registrars and uh, this would be another transaction where fleets can go in person to a deputy registrar and get over the counter same day service. Uh, right now these transactions are done um, either via mail or, or online and would require us to mail them, the, mail the plates or mail the stickers. Um, so this would be, I, I, we, we would help, the agency doesn't have any concerns with this. Great. Thank you. Members, questions on the A31? All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Mr. Right. Chair, I've got one more here. All right. Senator Howell. It, uh, I offer the A30 amendment, and the A30 amendment, I believe it's in the packets, Yes. The A30 amendment, what that does is with the new money that uh, we're going to collect from the passenger rail, this would basically just uh, require a report telling us where that money's going and uh, how much we're getting. All right. So Senator Howe offers the A30. Questions from the committee on the A30, just uh, basically asking for a report on the expenditure of uh, passenger rail receipts. All right, nothing further. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The A30 is adopted. All right. Yeah, we'll pause for a moment. Mr. Chair? Senator Jasinski. I'd ask to take uh, the A38 off the table. Senator Drzezinski uh, takes the A38 off the table. The A38 is in front of us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. After discussing with uh, council and staff, I believe we do not need the oral amendment. So All right. uh, we would just uh, stand as the A38 with no amendment. All right. No oral amendment, sorry. All right. All right. So um, the A38, absent any amendments, uh, is before us. Questions, members? All in favor of the A38 say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries.
Right. So members, I, uh, oh, Senator Howe. Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A56 amendment. Oh, Senator Howe offers the A56 amendment. Coming around. And, and Mr. Chair, I'll just explain it while it's being handed out. But what this does is uh, it takes $8 million from the Northern Lights Express and gives it to town loans, roads, and bridges. Just this week, I got pictures sent to me by my city administrator showing that a culvert had collapsed. Basically, a bridge had collapsed. And uh, there as we know, we have all kinds of deficient bridges throughout the state, and I think this would uh, go a long ways to helping us assist those townships and those small cities in uh, addressing some of the deficiencies that we have out there. So that's my, that's the gist of the amendment. Uh, thank you, Senator Howe. Um, Senator Howe, I would oppose the uh, A56 um, for a couple of reasons. One is the source that we're taking the money from the NLX, um, you know, while I will acknowledge that that's um, almost $200 million is kind of parked um, uh, for the foreseeable future, um, it is important to be able to point to that, that full amount um, as the state works towards, um, I don't know what they call it in inner city passenger rail and transit, we call it the full funding grant agreement. Um, with the FTA, I don't know what it's called, with the FRA, um, but we're working diligently to that and we need to continue to be able to point to basically the entirety of the state match is, is there and secure and is, is not subject um, to, to, well, I won't use the word raid, but you know, you get the idea. Um, uh, number one, number two, um, you know, while I would be interested in engaging with townships about their funding needs, I will say that townships are in a somewhat different position um, than small cities in that um, they do draw from the HUTDF, um, uh, which is a source that we added to fairly substantially um, in the past year uh, with new resources, plus they also participate um, in, the, in the TAA, um, so more funds are coming um, to townships. Um, you know, unlike the orphan of the small cities that we had for, for so many years. That being said, I'm, you know, wide open to, you know, if, if, we're, if we're falling short on townships in the short term, I'm open to that discussion, but I'm not comfortable with A56 at this point. Well, M Mr. Chair, uh, this, and my sit, the small city that I'm sitting in uh, is just under 2,500. So it's not, it's not a township road, even though the, the culvert or the bridge that we're talking about was actually made out of two rail cars, two uh, bulk rail cars, and now it has collapsed finally. And, uh, and it's basically the main road into a, a, a lake area. And now they've got to go, the emergency vehicles have got to go the long way around to get to them. So uh, any way I can find some dollars to beef up the small cities and the, t and the county, uh, the, that road and bridge fund that, that, they can, that small cities and, and uh, townships can tap into is, is vital. And the, the amount of deficient bridges we have throughout the state is, in those small cities is, is uh, quite large. So that's why I'm looking at this. If it's in my backyard, I know it's in a lot of other backyards. Thank you, I, pr I appreciate that. We want to continue to have this conversation. Um, maybe we can find a way to address that particular situation. Um, all right, anything further on the A56? Um, I'll request a roll call. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Dibble? No. <clears throat> Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Bolden? No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? Uh, no. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? 
Aye. Senator McEwen. Senator McEwen. With four yes votes and five no votes, the A56 is not adopted. Senator Dzinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess to the audience, we're down to our last five here, so bear with me for a minute here. Uh, 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 again, I want to thank our staff. They've done a phenomenal job today. We have all kinds of amendments, so again, thanks uh, to our uh, staff. Um, I'd like to offer the A57 amendment. Senator Dzinski offers the A57 amendment. And thank you, Mr. Chair. While I think that one needs to be distributed, uh, this is uh, Senate, uh, my Senate file 5275. This actually speeds up the auto parts sales tax uh, collections. Uh, I know you have a limited target, uh, and I know everyone's fighting for money, but again, I think uh, our roads and bridges are so important in Minnesota. By uh, speeding this process up uh, and collect more money from existing taxes uh, to put towards our roads and bridges uh, would be a great uh, uh, item. So with that, I ask for your support of the A57. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Dzinski offers the A57 to accelerate the um, phase-in of the auto parts sales tax, um, something I support very strongly but cannot support uh, at this moment. But I respect your offering it. And you probably wouldn't be doing your job if you didn't. So. <laughs> um, and uh, also just to let you know, Senator Trzinski, uh, as well as the public and members know that uh, uh, this continues to be a very active conversation. So I haven't given up. Uh, still working on it as recently as this morning with very powerful people around here. So, um, so with, uh, with that, I will ask um, the committee if you have any questions or anything further on the A57. Um, I'll request a roll call. The clerk will take the roll, please. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Bolden? No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? No. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen? With four yes votes and five no votes, the A57 is not adopted. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A77 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A77 amendment. And Mr. Chair, while it's being distributed, uh, this, uh, what this does in effect is it deletes the speed camera language in, in the bill. Uh, not that we don't agree with that. We want to make sure work zones are safe and those all those items. It's more of just, a, a, I guess, a theoretical way of what we believe, uh, you know, don't agree on as far as uh, cameras versus law enforcement doing these jobs, uh, concerns with the processes of a, of, of a car versus a person. Uh, and all those things that happen to, with an automated uh, camera system to giving out tickets. I uh, have some concern. I won't go on and on, but because we've had a long day, but uh, we would ask for the A77 and hope you would support it. Uh, thank you, Senator Jasinski, uh, for the A77. Um, I will ask for a no vote on this myself, um, but before I say why, I'll recognize Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I tell you what, I I do support the use of speed cameras in the in the manner that the Mendota Heights police chief uses them. So they sent, they set them out there and we heard this when we heard the bill, they put them out, they send letters to them and if they have enough violations, they put a cop out there and they ticket them. And to me, that's the right use of that. And uh, to me, putting a, putting a person, putting, a, putting an officer, and I know that uh, DPS has an issue with this, but I, Every time I talk, I, I talk to a, uh, a uh, county con road worker and he, com he complained to the, uh, the county sheriff. The county sheriff put a deputy out there and they had five in an hour. And so that's the type of enforcement we need because 
That changes attitudes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Howe. Members, anything further on the A77? Senator Carlson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I support the amendment. Uh, I don't want to get any more speeding tickets, but uh, I think that we have too many people that are speeding already. And what's nice about this is it, it will patrol 24-7. So I think that's an important issue for me, is that we have to, we have to catch some of the really, uh, um, the lead foots. So, and, and I agree with Senator Howe that we, we need to do more on uh, catching and notifying uh, the, uh, the speeders, but uh, I think that this is just a test of the uh, camera system, and I think it's worthwhile trying. All right. Well, um, so I, I, I won't get into it now another time, but I do think a lot of the concerns articulated by my good friends um, have been addressed. I think Senator Muhammad has done a lot of work on the speed uh, and, and light camera enforcement policy um, that goes to issues of you know, are we, are we ticketing cars or people? Um, are we making sure people who are who they are? Um, you know, there's a whole long list of, of issues and critiques that have been raised through the process that uh, Senator Muhammad, I think, has done a masterful job of really responding to and, and tending to and, and really has something that uh, I think um, the public would support and uh, I think uh, many of you would support. Um, uh, and uh, we'll obviously have some more time to spend uh, talking about those as we go to finance on the floor. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I misspoke there. I said I support it, but I mean I support the initiative. I do not support the, uh, the amendment. So uh, thanks to Senator Jasinski for pointing it out. Oh, Senator Jasinski got excited there for a sec. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I like to be transparent. I don't like things to happen through, so I just want to make sure he you did do. flip one of my uh, members so, earlier. You, saw, you know me. So, I'm yeah. just an honest guy from <laughs> southern Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, he rolled the chair earlier, Senator Jasinski. Um, all right. So uh, I will request a roll call and ask the clerk to take the roll. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Bolden? No. Senator Carlson? No on the amendment. <laughs> Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? No. Senator Howe? Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen? With four yes votes and five no votes, the A77 is not adopted. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know the audience is going to be upset with this, but this is the last amendment. I'd like to offer the A52 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A52. And Mr. Chair, while that's being distributed, what this would do would, uh, again, I know we've talked about the Northern Links uh, and using that money, I would like to uh, use $20 million from the Northern Links uh, and give it to help pay for Senator Morrison's uh, cost uh, for the greenhouse gas language. So. With All that, right. I'll ask for a yes vote. All right. So, um, oh, we need to. All right, we need to um, put the bill on or the amendment on the table for just a moment while copies are procured. Um, so we'll, we'll lay. What is it? Seven. So the A fifty two is on the table. Um, so I will uh, take a stab at a couple of amendments that are hanging around. Um, we're going to pause a moment. I might need to fix this amendment up a little bit. So one moment.
All right. It has been fixed up. So uh, I will offer the A79 amendment. Um, and while it comes around, um, I'll explain it. So this is uh, similar to the amendment that was added on the floor by Senator Westrom. And this comes from Senator West Westrom as well. Um, and it's uh, his continuing effort um, to propel a conversation around creating what he terms dynamic transportation options. Um, so uh, another way of thinking about that is uh, creating on-demand transportation services, particularly for people who are mobility impaired uh, in greater Minnesota um, or you know, Lyft and Uber type of service uh, for people uh, across the state, but particularly uh, people with disabilities, mobility impairments, especially in greater Minnesota. Um, and then also uh, anticipating the much awaited uh, Metro Mobility Report uh, program review from the legislative auditor that's going to be forthcoming um, that uh, we anticipate will will have some critique of, of Metro, Metro Mobility um, and some ideas for some some reform and some improvements to how that paratransit is provided in the metropolitan area uh, for people, again, with mobility impairments. Um, so admittedly, I haven't read this very closely. It did, it did originally have a, a full-fledged pilot attached to it. Um, there are some resources, uh, $300,000 identified uh, for, the, for the study, um, taken from a reduction in the appropriation from last year to the IIJA match. Um, and uh, I would appreciate support for the A79. I don't know if this is how it will ultimately end up, um, if, if at all, um, but would very much appreciate, uh, I've been partnering with Senator Champion, or excuse me, Senator Westrom on this conversation um, now for a couple of years and would appreciate the opportunity to continue the conversation um, and see as we go forward into uh, finance and on the floor in conference um, if this is an idea that has merit. Um, so questions, members, on the A79. I'll wait for Senator Jadzinski to return. <laughs> all right, I'll just take a vote. Uh, all in favor of the A79? Say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Oh, Senator Carlson, did you offer the A seventy nine? I said, Senator Carlson, did you offer the A seventy nine? I think you did. <laughs> All right. I think we missed that. All right. All right. Are, are we able? Are we ready to take? Yes. We have not. So. Um, if you want the last word, I've got one more amendment to offer. Oh, you? Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, I would like to offer the A29 amendment. Um, so the, the A29 simply um, uh, puts into, into law, codifies into law, the, the uh, understanding um, that we have going forward that the sales tax, the metropolitan area sales tax, um, that is... Uh, was enacted last year for the Met Council transit purposes um, is not, was, wasn't intended, and so this kind of, kind of validates that intention uh, for construction purposes of light rail. It's available for many, many other transit-related activities, constructing bus rapid transit, both ABRT as well as uh, freeway BRT, and of course, um, this, is, this will be the sole source of funding for operating all transit in the metropolitan area for expanding regular route uh, service, uh, et cetera. Um, the, the source uh, for the construction of light rail transit, of course, uh, is the uh, half cent uh, sales tax that's generated by a number of the counties, particularly Hennepin County. Uh, and so this just uh, establishes that in law. So, um, so I renew the 829. Any questions, members? All right. Senator Carlson. 
You offering the 829? All right. Questions on the 829? All right. All in favor, oh, Senator Howe? I was just going to make a, uh, we should uh, probably prohibit them from using any funds on any other transit line until they fix Southwest Rail Line. But uh, right. I, I won't make that amendment to your bill now. <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> All right. All in favor of the 829 say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I apologize to the, the uh, people in the audience. I thought that was our last amendment, but I didn't know you had a couple there. So no. uh, I'd like to take the A52 off the table. All right. I think I made that motion before. I might not. Right. If I did, I took it off the table before your amendment. All right. So the A52 is before us. Senator Jasinski. Well, I think I already explained it Oh, once. yes. Yes, you did. Uh, um, I just wanted to have it in front of us. All right. Um, so uh, um, I'll speak for Senator Morrison, unless Senator Morrison wants to speak for herself. I'm fairly certain um, uh, Senator, both Senator Morrison and Senator McEwen would be opposed to the A52 for, for obvious reasons. Um, so uh, I'll ask the committee if there are any questions or anything further on the A52. Uh, I'll request a roll call and ask the clerk to take the roll on the A52. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Bolden? No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? No. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen? Vice Chair Morrison? Senator McEwen? And Drzezinski, so close, on a vote of four to four, uh, the A52 is not adopted. All right, members, anything further on Senate File 5284? Senator Drzezinski. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. I just want to appreciate, uh, say appreciation again. Once again, I can't say enough for our staff. Uh, they've had a tough three days. There's a lot of amendments. I, uh, Ms. Boyd has so many written out on her on her agenda that I can't count them all, but there are a lot. And Mr. Greenfield uh, and all our staff have done a phenomenal job. Uh, Mr. Frazier as well, and Mr. Linetti, all our staff members are just thank you. Uh, and, I, and I really do think uh, we've compromised on a lot of things, so I want to thank you for that, allowing some of our bills, uh, modifying some things to try and make the bill better. Uh, I am going to vote for it today. Uh, I don't know in the end if I will be able to. Uh, again, I want your uh, hope that our strong support when this goes a conference that you stand up for our our policies that we've added to those and not just see them uh, get stripped out um, because I think some of them are very good for the state of Minnesota. I uh, really appreciate the work you've done on the deputy registers to get some more money to them. Uh, that's really, really the reason I'm voting for this is because we were open to do that and get more money as well as small cities getting an additional $10 million. Uh, to me, this compromise is worth voting in favor of. Uh, I know all my members may not want to, but I, I think it's uh, my duty to uh, say thank you for all the work you've done with us uh, to come to a compromise between Republicans and Democrats to get a bill out. Uh, again, now not everybody's going to be in favor of it. I do have some concerns concerns over as things I've said with the greenhouse gases, uh, the safety issue, vehicle miles traveled. I have some issues with speed cameras, uh, not because of safety, but just because of shifting to a mechanical type thing versus an in-person law enforcement officer. But uh, uh, I want to, again, thank you. I uh, will vote in favor of it. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back to you. And I apologize to the uh, people in the uh, audience who went through a lot of uh, hours here today to get this bill. Uh, but I think it's uh, better as it started out. So thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Zinsky, um, and uh, I echo um, the thanks uh, to our staff. It's been uh, uh, wild and woolly and kind of crazy, and uh, I, can, I can tell you I was up uh, well past midnight, and they were still sending, uh, sending emails and uh, updates and asking questions, uh, and then uh, I got a few hours, and then uh, 
uh, as I was opening my eyes at 5.30, I got my first email from Ms. Boyd. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, Beth and uh, Beth Ethier and Alex Will and every, everyone, you know, everyone over here in our pages, of course, do a tremendous, tremendous job. And thank you to everyone here who participates in the work of uh, transportation in Minnesota um, and in this committee, because I think we do really, really good work and we do really good collaboration. Thank you to Dave Frazier as well for all of his work. Um, and thank you for your patience and forbearance. This is how we roll here. You know, things just don't quite uh, go as we as we would hope on schedule. Um, but uh, but I think we, you know we we're getting out of here at a pretty decent time. It's a quarter to six. Um, it's not midnight. Um, you know, the, the the little secret here was our our deadline was midnight. I don't know if people actually knew that. Um, uh, so uh, I'm glad we're not at midnight. Um, so again, I just uh, echo the appreciation, um, and I think we have a good package here. Um, and uh, as we move towards a conference, um, you're going to be my full partner, Senator Drzezinski, um, and we will continue to work on this package and absolutely defend the, the position of the Senate because we've done good work here. Um, what did uh, Representative Khan used to say? The uh, Republicans are the opposition, but the other chamber is the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> So I think, no, I actually think we'll get good work done uh, with our partners over on the other side and looking forward to that as well. So with that, I um, need to make the final motion. All right, so uh, final motion. Um, so I would, no, I think Senator Carlson needs to move. Uh, Senate file, no, I can move the bill. Okay. It's my bill. Um, Senate file 5284 as amended. Uh, be recommended to pass and refer to finance. Um, do I need to make any of the cleanup uh, motions, technical changes? All right. So um, I will also add as a part of my motion uh, to empower and ask staff to make any grammatical or technical changes as necessary as the engrossment is prepared. Uh, or the committee, an official committee engrossment is prepared. And, no, I guess it's, it will be a full engrossment once we adopt it on the floor um, for finance. So does that motion fit the bill? It's lengthy, but it All right, <laughs> very good. Um, anything further, members? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you, members. Uh, thank you to the public. We are adjourned.